Okay, why don't why don't we get started? Um, hi, Rajiv the Hedge here again. Um, and on um, behalf of um, all the organizers, um, thanks for, for being here uh, early for some of you um, and Saturday for all of us. Um, but we have three um, excellent papers on the third day of the conference. So uh, Ondrila Dubé is going to uh, chair the first session. So I'm going to turn it over to her. Great, good morning, everyone. So just to recap the quick rules, um, we are going to have 10 minutes without uh, questions. After that, please raise hand and uh, I'll ask you to unmute yourself to ask the question. Um, also throughout, you can type questions into the chat and uh, co-authors may be responding as we go along. Um, so the first presentation we have today is Absenteeism, Productivity and Relation Contracts Inside the Firm. The co-authors are Ach Azaru, Jean-Francois Gatier, Anand Nishadam, and Jorge Tamayo, and Anand will be presenting. Take it away, Anand. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for, for tuning in. Uh, thanks to the selection committee for including the paper. Very excited to present this here. Um, this is joint work with Ach Azaru, uh, Jorge Tamayo, as Andrea just said, and, um, and our uh, star PhD student, Jean-Francois Gautier, who should uh, be on the market soon, so please look out for him. Um, Today, I'm gonna to be talking about how relational contracts between managers of production teams uh, inside a firm uh, might be able to kind of deal with how worker absenteeism can impact productivity. Um, so, you know, as means of motivation, uh, you know, workplace collaboration is the result of a series of many small uh, non-contractable transactions, uh, this kind of constant exchanging of favors between coworkers. Um, and most of the time, it's going to be really costly or maybe even impossible to specify all the terms of these interactions. Uh, it's going to be infeasible to enforce them in any formal or legal way. Um, and they might often be based on limited information. So for example, you might ask a, a, a colleague to do you a favor. They might actually turn you down saying that they can't do it. You don't know whether they can't or they just don't want to. Um, or they might actually help you with, with this favor and, and you, don't, you maybe can't observe how, how conscientiously they kind of uh, uh, do it for you. Um, but the repeated nature of these interactions uh, are going to make this, these kind of relationships in the workplace sustainable. Uh, much of the canonical theory of the firm uh, makes exactly these types of relationships explicit. Um, but despite the ubiquity and importance we think these exchanging of favors have in the workplace, there really isn't that much empirical work inside the firm uh, documenting these interactions between coworkers. Um, now, between firms, let's say in a supply chain relationship between buyers and, and suppliers, um, a lot of the terms of interactions are recorded. Prices, quantities, timelines of deliveries, uh, maybe other elements of the quality of the service of these interactions. Um, but, and, and, and actually because all of all of that documentation, some really great papers have been able to study uh, the nature of these interactions um, and kind of test the theories we've written down about how, how these interactions should evolve, relationships should evolve. Um, inside the firm, a lot of this mutual back scratching seems maybe too ordinary or inconsequential uh, to record. And so we don't really, in the absence of these records, uh, a lot of questions remain about how relationships kind of evolve inside the firm. So for example, how prevalent are relational contracts in the workplace? What kinds of frictions give rise to them? Um, and how well do they work? So how close to first best cooperation do we really get? Um, you know, if not that close, uh, what are the types of barriers that prevent, let's say, a particular relationship from forming um, or a relationship from uh, maturing to its kind of most uh, efficient uh, version? Well, this is the type of uh, kind of gap we're gonna try to fill with this paper. Um, using granular productivity data, uh, granular data from the workplace, personnel data from the workplace of uh, garment factories in India. So in the garment sector, uh, workers are organized into production lines, teams, uh, and they're pretty large, 50 workers per team, kind of uh, supervised by a manager. Now, each worker is, is gonna be assigned to kind of what we're gonna call her home line. She's gonna spend the vast majority, like 90% or more of her time on this one line, let's say over any three month or several month period. Um, but we are gonna see that occasionally she gets shuffled to other lines. Um, in order to deal with kind of idiosyncratic absenteeism, worker absenteeism across the different production teams. Um, and, uh, you know, whether she gets uh, actually shuffled to help out another team is ultimately going to be the decision of the supervisor of her home line. So that supervisor is going to have to say whether they're able or willing uh, to spare that worker uh, for another team. 
And in the data, what we're going to see that's going to be important for, for kind of exploring all of this is that we're going to see, okay, which of the workers who call a particular uh, line home are absent on a given day. Uh, of the workers that show up, um, which of those workers are going to actually work on their home line that they usually work on or which are going to be uh, shuffled out, lent out to a different line. Um, and then we're going to see, okay, uh, given the realized absenteeism of all these different lines in the factory, uh, given any uh, redistribution we see happening of the workers, uh, you know, what is the resulting productivity of every team? Importantly, we're also going to see some other features that we think are important to the story. How close together are these lines in the factory? Are they on the same floor? Are they next to, next to each other? Um, and who are the specific managers? How similar are managers of any two lines demographically? Um, how long have any uh, two managers been, uh, been uh, coordinating in this way? Now, this uh, issue of absenteeism in the workplace has been documented the world over, but it's been particularly shown to, to, to be a, a major problem in developing country organizations. So uh, with a lot of evidence from the education sector um, and healthcare settings, um, we can see that you know, this is a substantial problem in developing countries, but also we, we've seen that there can be large consequences for performance and productivity. Um, some evidence from, from scientific innovation and, and even professional sports kind of is, is part of this as well. Um, in our setting, we're gonna find that, you know, we have a very labor intensive technology. So, so which workers show up or how many workers you have is gonna be really important, um, but there's gonna be substantial and idiosyncratic absenteeism. So what I mean by that is that absenteeism is gonna be often very large and it's gonna be really, you know, low correlation within a factory within a day, right? Less than 0.15. Um, so what that means is that, uh, you know, on a given day, uh, one team is gonna be made to produce with a vastly different number of workers than first of all, they had yesterday or may, might have tomorrow. But also we're gonna find that on a given factory floor on a given day, one line is, is being asked to produce with far less workers than might be maximally productive. And then another line nearby is actually, uh, you know, has available way more workers than they might actually need, right? So I'll show you in the data what that means, but um, you know, they might actually have workers, so many workers that the end worker really, you know, their marginal product is almost nothing. Um, now, what that means is that there's this kind of internal misallocation of labor in a factory uh, um, on a given day uh, across these production teams. Um, so that means that there is going to be uh, an opportunity to uh, address this mis internal misallocation and have gains from kind of redistributing. Um, importantly, supervisors are not going to be incentivized to do that. They're actually entirely incentivized on their own Productivity, the productivity of their own lines. Um, you know, they they can earn a bonus if they get productivity above a certain level, and then that bonus actually grows linearly above that level. Um, so now, you know, against this backdrop, we're going to ask, okay, despite those incentives, uh, and and you know, given the kind of idiosyncratic and, and and kind of large absenteeism, can relational contracts between the managers of these teams uh, actually help to solve the internal misallocation problem? Uh, that is like on a given day, if we see uh, you know, a manager that has a wealth of, uh, of workers, um, are they gonna be willing to share that, any of those workers with a fellow manager that's suffering from uh, you know, a particularly large absenteeism shock? Uh, the short answer is gonna be yes, as a spoiler. Um, but, but then we're gonna ask a whole you know, bunch of other interesting questions. Well, just do, do some pairs of managers trade more than do other managers? Uh, if so, what seems to determine this? Does the past trading history matter? Uh, the maturity of the relationship does, uh, you know, kind of how close they are uh, in the factory uh, uh, matter, and, and does the similarity of of the two managers, you know, demographically, does that does that matter? Um, we're also going to be interested in what the productivity implications of this are, of course. Um, so that's to say, you know, uh, given the absenteeism we see and net of any shuffling, uh, you know, in, in these relationships, this resource sharing, these relationships, um, are we going to see that productivity gets close to first best? Or if we're really far from first best, uh, you know, how much better could we do, and in what way? Um, so, you know, the, the the short answer here is that we're going to find that there's, you know, on the order of one and a half million dollars in profit annually for this firm from doing this type of full redistribution, if they can, if they can figure out how to do it. Um, and frankly, even like you know, a large portion of this, let's say a million of this, you might get uh, even in a more reasonable kind of uh, counterfactual where you just try to make some of the inactive partnerships look a bit more like the active partnerships. Um, so let me, let me get into kind of what the data looks like in our setting a little bit and describe this. Okay, so, so in our setting, we're gonna have 
four factories. Let's say on any particular factory four, on average, you're going to have five for different production lines working simultaneously, but on independent orders. Um, there's going to be on average three to four uh, lines per factory. Um, and so that means there's about 17 or 18 lines in the, in the whole factory. Um, now, on any given day, 51 workers on average are going to be working on a particular line. Now, remember, not all of those workers who are working on that line on a given day call that line home. Some of them have been borrowed, right? Um, so if we look at it the other way, uh, a line has, you know, on average, 56 workers who, who call that line home. And on average, six of them on any day are, are missing, they're absent. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, in this setting, absenteeism is both frequent and often very large. So let's, let, let's look at some of the, the numbers here. You know, on average, you're talking about 11% absenteeism uh, daily uh, for a particular line. That's five or six workers missing on average. But the standard deviation is 13 percentage points. So that's an additional plus minus seven workers that might either show up unexpectedly uh, or, or be missing unexpectedly. So to put that in perspective, on a given day, one line on a factory floor, at least one line, is going to be missing two more workers than they're used to. Or in an entire factory of, let's say, 16 or 17 lines, at least one of these lines is, is going to be actually missing eight more workers than they're used to. This is like a huge amount of workers that they're missing that, that, that could you know, uh, have a substantial effect on productivity, which we're going to show you uh, coming up. The other thing, as I mentioned, that the, is that the correlation within factory floor within day is very low. So, so there's, uh, you know, there's significant opportunity for some sort of redistribution here. Now, why is absenteeism so idiosyncratic, so kind of uncorrelated? You know, there's a lot of reasons for, for why workers are absent. And frankly, they're not particularly forthcoming both in advance, they don't really uh, inform. After the fact, they're not really honest about why it is they were, they were, uh, they were gone necessarily. But anecdotally, we have a sense that um, you know, it can be about health shocks to them or their family. Um, it can be kind of often about kind of cultural or religious festivals that are unique to their particular native place that might call them back or some sort of seasonal uh, agricultural uh, kind of uh, opportunity. So they'll go for a couple of days and then they'll, uh, or a week or so and then come back. Um, Anand, Anand yeah. there's a question by Eric Verhugan um, yeah. that I think would be good to answer. Eric, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Sure, sure, sure. And maybe this is something you're going to get to later, but it's just do not higher levels of management somehow get involved in this trading of workers across, or is it completely decentralized by the managers? And, you know, it seems like they would have an incentive to be involved. Absolutely. It looks like it's very decentralized. I'm, it's decentralized. I'm going to tell you why. I think that there is some in, information frictions that, and, and some span of time kind of problems uh, to solve this problem at the beginning of the day. Um, the short answer is, you know, you're only going to know which workers are going to show up. They don't tell you in advance. So within five minutes of when the you kind of wait up until the last minute to see who's really going to show up, who might be tardy, um, then you see who you've got, and then and then in some sense the you know the the floor in charge, the upper level manager that's got six, seven, ten lines that they're supervising can't possibly kind of figure out who's got who's got which workers that showed up, who needs what, and go around and, and kind of solve this problem. So they actually seem to just um, both when we ask them and kind of in the data they seem to just kind of go to a the people they're used to kind of transacting with and, and ask them, okay, well, here, this is looks, this looks like who I'm going to have today. I really need one, two, three more, more people. I'm, I'm going to describe a little bit more uh, in a second, but. Um, so just, just a quick follow up, just, yes. so we, we have to think of all these lines being different firms effectively. There's nothing that makes them the same firm. Uh, well, the technology is the same. Uh, they're, they're pretty balanced in terms of like the, the protection technology, like the machines they've got are the same quality. Uh, well, you know, okay. the, the, no, 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 different firms in real life can have the same technology. I'm saying, right, right, right. You're saying that, yeah, there's, there's no real shared resource when it comes down to the kind of, how do I turn people I've got plus the kind of fixed proportion of labor that matches that, I'm sorry, fixed proportion of materials and machines uh, okay. into garments. They're so producing different how, orders independently. Got sorry. It. Yeah, that's how you want us to think about it. For I think so. Yeah, I think so. We'll we'll you know, we'll get more of the details, but I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and I'm going to get more into this, Eric, in, uh, in just a second. But um, okay, so one last thing I want to make is that point I want to make is that there really are few consequences to absenteeism for the work. So they're going to lose that day's wages if they don't show up. But there's almost no firing here. Uh, both, you know, the, the regulations are really restrict, uh, restrictive, and so you have to make this really long-standing case of, of, you know, cause for firing, and it's easy to be sued and so on. But, uh, but also just because of how large the firm is uh, and how big their workforce. But also, uh, you know, there's just kind of this kind of constant residual demand. Um, 
So let me talk a little bit more exactly about, about how production works here. So um, a garment takes, let's say on average 30 minutes to make if one person were making it beginning to end. But the reality of course, is that no person is gonna sit down and make that, that entire uh, garment all, all at once. Uh, they're gonna subdivide it into on average about 50 different machine operations. Um, each of those taking about, let's say 0.6 minutes on average, but with a lot of variation depending on the skill and concentration required. So now suppose I have 50 operations I have to do, um, but I have less than 50 workers that showed up today. Well, what I'm gonna have to do is if I can't get any extra workers is I'm gonna have to say, okay, well, who's my fastest or most, comp you know, most competent person. Let me take my easiest two or fastest two operations and let that person double up on, on, on those operations. And then let me adjust some of the other uh, worker machine kind of mappings to balance out productivity. Because of course, at the end of the day, I don't need a hundred collars, but 50 uh, uh, shirt bodies, I need to kind of balance this out. Um, but now, of course, even net of all of this rejiggering, um, you know, the line productivity is going to be slower than if I had more workers to fill every machine as opposed to having somebody double up. Um, and we can think about it in the opposite direction too. Suppose I have more than 50 workers. Well, there's gonna be some operations that are gonna benefit from having a helper, okay? So this person's not gonna be themselves working on a machine, but let's say they fold a, a seam, iron it, and then give it to the machine operator to feed into the machine. That's gonna speed things up at that, at that particular operation that might be critical and might be a common bottleneck. Uh, another way might be, for example, it, to say, hey, I'm just gonna double up some of these critical operations. The collar keeps holding me up, it's a bottleneck for this, for this output, so I'm gonna put two people there. If I have them available, I can put two. But there's gonna be a limit to this. So what we see in these, in these graphs here is that if, if we plot uh, average efficiency uh, as a function of, you know, on the left, the percentage of your home line workers that are absent, uh, or on the right, as a function of the percent of workers you have who show up, irrespective of whether this is their home line, you're gonna see, of course, it's increasing, but concave. So there's gonna be a point at which the extra worker doesn't, can't really help you that much. You've already put a helper wherever a helper could be helpful. You've already doubled up the most critical operations. Uh, and so you'd need a vastly larger number of, of workers to, to kind of make any real effect, right? So in this kind of flatter region, that's really important, right? Is that there are gonna be lines that idiosyncratically are gonna have more workers show up today. Um, and they're actually gonna be in this region where those extra workers aren't really giving them much. And that means they can truly spare them. Um, and, and what the graph kind of tells us is that that number looks something like uh, around 8%, seven or 8% absenteeism of the home line workers, um, you're gonna start to flatten out, right? So if you have less than that, let's say you have 52 workers present, you're gonna be kind of at the peak. And if you have 53, 54 workers, um, they're not really adding much, right? Um, and so how does the firm then deal with this, this kind of absenteeism that seems so, so rampant? Well. One thing we want to note is that the average absenteeism at 11% is actually higher than that peak I just showed you, right? If, if, if average absenteeism were 8%, you really wouldn't be losing much, much on average per se. So the firm seems to be actually over hiring, which is interesting because this demonstrates that the firm knows that absenteeism is a problem, knows that it's costly, and so actually is maintaining a larger workforce than, than they would need if everyone were to show up. Um, but they're not quite able to over hire enough Right? So they're at, a, at kind of 11%, but they've only kind of optimized for kind of 8%. Um, but of course, more importantly for everything we're gonna talk about today is that on any given day, some lines are gonna have vastly more than 8% missing uh, and other lines are gonna have less. They might have no one missing today and they might be in that flat part of the curve and have some workers to spare. Um, so coming back to Eric's point though, um, there's gonna be a key information friction here that's gonna make it difficult to number one, formally contract here um, but also to have kind of an upper level manager solve this problem in some sense, right? Which is that, you know, as I just described, suppose I have more workers or I have less workers, there's all these recalibrations that I can do. If I'm the supervisor, I know the garment I'm making, I know which are the most critical operations of the bottlenecks. I know who actually showed up today. So did, did one of my stars who, who usually can double up operations when I need them to, did she show up today? Um, and so when I go to a fellow manager or even to let's say an upper level manager and I say, hey, I really need two, three, four workers, it's not easily verifiable how badly I need those workers. And if somebody comes to me and says, hey, can you spare two or three workers? It's not easily verifiable if they say no, whether they actually could spare them and they just don't want to, right? Because they just wanna maximize the probability of them getting into that bonus range of their of productivity or, or maximize the, the amount of bonus they can get.
Does that make sense? Anand, uh, the Braj has a question about overhiring and what it means. The Braj, do you want to go ahead? I'll pass. I'll pass. It's it's okay. It's not not a big deal at the moment. Great. All right. Well, we'll come back to it if it if it comes up. Um, so so that's that's I think the, the the key information friction here that's going to make number one the transactions between any two frontline manager, a supervisor of a line kind of not easily verifiable, contractable, you know, kind of in a formal sense, but also it's going to limit the, the, the degree to which an upper level manager can really effectively coordinate among six, seven, 10 lines uh, that's, that, uh, that report to, to them. And, and, and just, you know, Eric, to your point also, you know, just to make sure that we understand what's going on here, when we first started seeing this idiosyncratic uh, absenteeism problem, this kind of internal misallocation it looked like, and some flow of workers between lines, we just went and asked frontline supervisors in focus group discussions, you know, how do you deal with this absenteeism problem? Um, and they said, you know, well, I try to get workers from other managers by talking to those managers directly, right, to these other lines. Um, they said, I don't actually usually need to make additional efforts beyond that because everyone kind of understands the situation. Um, it's kind of a professional practice. Um, because they know that they might need to borrow workers in the future. Um, and, and then they also said, you know, oh, most of my relationships tend to be just from with managers who tend to be on the same floor. Um, and, and because they know that, you know, uh, there's mutual benefit here. So this just kind of, you know, corroborates our intuition. But the question is in the data. Uh, sorry, Eric, you have a question. Yeah, just to follow up quickly. Sorry. So it may not be a pure relational contract between these lower level managers, like, like they're interacting in the shadow of upper level management, right? And so I it sort of that may affect, you know, it may make it easier essentially to arrive at sort of relational totally. contracts between them, because you have this potential enforcement from above. I totally agree with that. Totally. Now, I, I'm going to see we're going to see that in some sense. Now, I, I totally agree with you. And I, I don't think we, we need that, for example, um, the upper level, you know, not pissing off your upper level manager doesn't kind of play into your, your incentive compatibility constraint, right? That might just kind of uh, make it bind a little bit more in some sense. Um, but it's good, what's interesting here is that we're gonna see that, uh, actually I think this data is gonna answer it directly. It doesn't seem like that's the predominant feature because of the following. There's six or seven lines on your factory uh, floor on average. They all report to the same upper level manager. And yet you still only trade with like two of them, right? And, and then there's a PM above that. There's a production manager above that, that, that cares about the productivity of the whole factory, 20, 20 plus lines uh, in, for, you know, on average for these managers. Um, and, and still you're gonna only trade actively with two or three. Um, and if we, if we look in the lifetime of the data, you know, the number of managers you ever deal with, it's still only gonna be maximum 15. You're just still gonna leave these kind of five or six that are, that are un, untouched. Now that doesn't obviate the, the, ch the chances of an upper level manager getting involved, but it, it seems to say the upper level manager should maybe want you to kind of trade with anyone and everyone who needs who needs help, um, but you don't seem to be doing it. Debra? Sorry, quick question. Um, how are, are line managers getting paid piece rates or salaries? They're paid their sa fixed salary, but they're eligible every day for a bonus if they achieve a productivity above uh, a, a particular level. And then above that level, it's linear in the excess productivity. Okay, so they have, so, and, and the bonus is just based on the line line level output or the- Their own line level output that day. Okay, that so seems to be every day. order here, right? It's very important. It's okay. very important that the, you know, other than, okay, not pissing off my boss, being eligible for a promotion, all these other types of things that might matter. Uh, so I want to show I'm a team player. In monetary sense, I'm only incentivized on my own part. And I'm incentivized every day on my own. Sounds like a crazy firm to me. These firms. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, incentives are wrong. There's no top level guy over overseeing this stuff. No, no, there is a up. there is a top level guy overseeing, but he's doing uh, a lot of other things in some sense. You know, he's he's at, for example determining which line should work on which order. Uh, you know, uh, whether I whether we need to like put pressure to speed up in order to meet a deadline. You know, they've just got a bunch of other span of time, span of control kind of things. You know, and this particular thing is span of time right at the beginning of the day. So I, I actually know, I think I, I feel exactly what you're saying, which is that this is crazy. You know, uh, there should be some type of maybe technological solution to solve this at the beginning of the day. And the reality is, is that um, I don't disagree with you, but there isn't. And from what we've seen is that this is the largest producer of garments in India, one of the top five in the world. And it actually looks more or less like this in most of the garment factories we've ever talked to you know, around the world. Um, okay. Let me see, was there anything else? Yeah, so I just wanna say that, you know, so, so we, show, we saw that 
there's a whole bunch of these partnerships, potential partnerships that are not uh, being used, right? So one element of this is that, look, you're, we see on the right here that you're really mostly trading with people who are on the same floor with you and maybe even just the lines that are adjacent to you, right? So that means there's a whole bunch of lines under this, this uh, middle manager uh, that we talked about who, who are still there, still, st that middle manager still cares about them, um, but you're not active with them. And what's interesting on the demographic side is that there's gonna be a whole lot of kind of differences between these managers too. Now, the vast majority of them are gonna be male, but there is a number of female managers and given the cultural norms in the setting, it might be that the men are not willing to trade with the women or the women are not comfortable kind of approaching them. Um, vastly different education levels and, and actually also different experience levels in the sense that um, some of these managers entered the firm at the same time, maybe went through orientation and training together. Whereas a whole bunch of the other ones don't really know each other that well because they don't work on the same floor and they never went through training together and they never even went through orientation together, right? Okay. Okay, so what does that all add up to here? Well, as I mentioned, you know, we are gonna see borrowing happen, right? So on the left, we see that indeed as absenteeism increases, um, the borrowing, the number of workers borrowing, at small amounts of absenteeism, we actually see that they're able to kind of almost keep the size of the line. You see that there's fish in there now, Ron. Oh. They're almost able to keep the, the size of the line kind of flat, right? Um, but of course, quickly as the absenteeism shops get larger and larger, they're, they, it looks like they're, it's harder to smooth that fully. The actual, the size of the line, the, the amount of workers you're, you're gonna produce with uh, does go down. Um, now, given that the production function was increasing in concave in the number of workers you have working, um, we might expect that absent any costs or constraints in coordination that, that as, as absenteeism increases, that certainly my borrowing should both continue to increase and maybe even be convex, but that's not what we see on the right. Um, so there might be a bunch of explanations for that, but one potential thing is that this, is, this, this kind of concavity in the, uh, in the absenteeism, the borrowing as a function of absenteeism might reflect the difficulty in making either one big transaction, getting six, seven, you know, or more workers from, from, from just your one main trading partner that, you, that you're active with, um, or simultaneously doing a bunch of small transactions all, uh, you know, at the same time and you know, within the first kind of five, 10 minutes of the day before production has to start, right? So to put this in perspective, somebody on the right-hand side here of this, of this right graph at 20% productivity needs an extra six or seven workers just to get back to that peak uh, productivity of, of 52 workers, right? The, the odds that, they're, that their main trading partner can share, can spare six or seven workers are pretty low. Um, and, the, and then, so then the, the uh, being able to then, you know, transact with three or four managers all, all uh, you know, actively, let's say at the start of one day might be very difficult. And we see that when we look at how um, you know, these relationships get maintained as well, right? So we showed that you have this one main trading partner. Um, on the left, we see that, yeah, 40% of all your, your worker sharing is going to happen. All your borrowing is going to come from that one partner. I think what's really interesting here uh, and consistent with, with this kind of relationship is that you're paying it back. It's super balanced, right? I borrow 40% of my borrowing comes from the main trading partner, but 40% of my lending also goes to that main partner. Right, and then the, the next active partnership, which is far less active, half as half as uh, intensive, but it's still balanced in this kind of borrowing lending pattern, right? And that's not something we would expect necessarily if, for example, this was all centrally coordinated, even at, at, at or or like you know predominantly centrally coordinated at a, at a middle manager level, um, because you would expect that there are going to be some lines that have, on average, higher absenteeism and might be net borrowers, and some lines that are. Uh, you know, a lower absenteeism on average and, and net lenders. Uh, and so the flows wouldn't necessarily be balanced in this biological way. Um, on the right, we can look at this one other way, which is say, now let's just dive into this first bar here, this one main partner, and say, suppose you've been trading with this one main partner for at least a month, uh, and that's the active relationship you keep going back to. And then the manager of that line that you usually trade with leaves the firm. Well, if the upper level manager is really participating heavily in this, it shouldn't matter who the identity of that, of that line supervisor is. Um, my borrowing should go on just because that was the, the best kind of relationship we had going back and forth. Um, but that's not what we find. What we find is that the borrowing actually drops significantly and stays low for at least eight weeks as kind of trust and reciprocity seems to build back up, right? 
So now all of this is, are, are just kind of, you know, uh, all of this is really, I think, fascinating behavior, but the big question from a, from a you know, uh, an economics perspective is, well, okay, but does the degree to which that borrowing is limited mean that the, the, the kind of end line smoothing is not as good as it could be, right? That the insulation of productivity against absenteeism shocks is not as good as it could be. So here we can look at this in a couple of different ways. So first we can, we can regress the efficiency of a line on the, the percentage of absenteeism uh, of their home line workers. Um, and then we can include all these kind of rich fixed effects, right? So suppose your risk sharing pool is your factory uh, or your or a factory floor even uh, on, on a given day. Well, of course, if the aggregate amount of workers on in that factory goes down, then some of that shock is not insurable. You can't really insulate anyone, right? Even if you redistribute. So let's put in a fixed effect for all of these seasonality patterns. Let's even, you know, even, so this right column, you know, says that even when we kind of do this rich, uh, these rich fixed effects, um, you're still going to see that one percentage point increase in, in absenteeism is going to lead to a half a percent decrease in, in productivity. Uh, and that's going to be substantial when we get to the to kind of the end result here, the simulation. So I'm going to tell you how many dollars that is, but it's, it's, it's substantial. Um, and, and by the way, this coefficient is going to stay the same if we put in factory by date fixed effects. And it's also going to be the same if we are worried about, well, but absenteeism might be endogenous here, right? So maybe one of these managers is a jerk or they've, they're having a bad week and they're, and they're being really mean to their, to their workers. And so, um, you know, that's both going to mean that it, absenteeism is going to be higher, but also whoever shows up is going to be less productive because they're stressed and, and being um, mistreated. Well, if we use just um, as a candidate instrument, the, the kind of number of workers on a line that are having, um, you know, some religious or cultural festival in their native place, uh, that's kind of unique to their state and their, and their, um, uh, their culture, um, as an instrument, we get actually statistically an identical coefficient. Um, so that just, you know, tells us that all those patterns we saw and how just how idiosyncratic uh, absenteeism is um, kind of hold up here. There really is, uh, on average, you know, these kind of really uh, worker-specific little, little things that are balanced across lines. By the way, we can also show uh, that indeed managers are seeing the exact same distribution of absenteeism. So we can do some distributional equivalence um, in, the, in the appendix of the paper. Okay, uh, this is just quickly to show that, that uh, you know, suppose we use the instrument, suppose we use these rich fixed effects and we try to do a non-parametric uh, kind of uh, function uh, function for productivity, um, the shape of that production function still looks exactly like what it was in the kind of raw data. You still have this flattening out of, of productivity at the top. So that still kind of confirms that there really is, uh, you know, if a line has all their workers show up one day, um, they actually don't know what to do with them. There's not much they can, they, you know, they can use them for. And so there is some residual capacity here uh, to share those workers. Okay. Okay, so now given all of this, um, we're gonna write down a model of uh, relational contracts in this setting, kind of stylized for exactly uh, the setting I just talked about um, and, uh, and try to build in the features that, that we just went over in the data. Okay, so in essence, this is gonna look like a Coat and Revelian risk sharing model, um, but we're gonna add two features that we just went over, right? One is gonna be that there's gonna be private need and, and, and because, and to make private need matter, we're gonna make private types, you know, uh, which I'll describe in a second. Um, and then there's gonna be transaction costs, right? So all pairs are not created equal when it comes to this, uh, to this trading method, right? So, okay, we're gonna have an infinitely lived set of managers for simplicity. We're, they're gonna have the same number of home line workers. Um, so the same size lines and so on. Um, and then they're gonna each, at, you know, at the beginning of each period, they're gonna realize uh, their stochastic absenteeism from symmetric but independent distributions, right? Now, the, all of that's kind of standard. Now, what's important here is that their true need of workers is gonna remain private, right? So kind of reflecting what I talked about, that I might be able to do some rejiggering, but only I know how to do that, given the garment that I'm producing today and which workers showed up, uh, what are my critical operations and so on, right? Um, and then there's gonna be these two types, right? I know my type, uh, but, my, but my potential partner doesn't know. Uh, doesn't know my type. And so, and I don't know their type. Um, and, and so the reliable type is going to always truthfully report their need. Um, but the unreliable type is going to lie with some known probability. Um, 
And uh, of course, then, you know, once they, they meet up and they state their need, uh, either truthfully or, 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 or not, um, then the, the manager that's reporting a higher need can potentially borrow from the manager that's reporting a lower need subject to some transaction costs. So those transaction costs, which are also going to be uh, kind of new or specific here, um, are going to affect both the extensive and the intensive margins. They're going to affect both whether or not a trade happens, right? If, this, if, if the gap in our needs is pretty small but the, and the transaction cost is really high, even though there's a gap, we may not actually exchange any workers. Um, but then it's also going to affect the kind of intensive margin, which is, okay, you know, the gap in our needs is, is larger than any transaction cost, but, it, but the transactions cost is going to play into kind of just how many workers I'm willing to, uh, to, to trade. Uh, okay. Then at the end of the period, uh, if uh, the, the unreliable type is found to have lied, uh, the relationship is terminated. Um, now, this, by the way, we can actually make that you know, for simplicity, we just make it so that, you know, if the unreliable type lies, uh, you know, they're found out uh, with, with probability one, well, we can make that probabilistic, something less than probability one, and actually everything goes, goes through just fine. Okay, so, so, what that, so what's going to happen here is that we can kind of describe a, a unique, symmetric, stationary relational contract that's going to prevail in, in equilibrium just among our types, right? Um, but we can also characterize the path to that steady state um, as, as managers learn about their kind of partner's types, right? Um, so here, uh, the optimal transfer in, in that equilibrium uh, relational contract is going to be a function of that this theta hat, which is basically a the efficient transfer. It's like the gap between our absenteeisms divided by two. So just equalizing our, our gap in absenteeism. Um, but then it's also going to depend on, of course, the transaction cost, right? Now, um, along the path to steady state, of course, we're also going to uh, care about our belief on whether the partner is reliable. And that's going to be a function of uh, the proportion of reliable managers in the population. So that's all pretty standard for, for these kind of relational contract uh, kind of setups. Now, one thing I want to point out, though, is that this actually set lends itself to a, a very nice alternative interpretation in which there's varying qualities of workers, right? So for example, we can actually set this up where uh, you, know, you have, let's say two types of workers, a productive worker that actually you know, lends itself to output and an unproductive worker that really doesn't, gain, doesn't give you anything. And we can make it so that, okay, both types actually tell the truth about how many uh, reliable workers they have who showed up today. And, and the reliable type always trades good workers, productive workers, but the unreliable type trades unproductive workers, masquerading them as, as reliable with some known probability. And that kind of just, all, all of the analysis would be very similar. The intuition would be a little bit uh, closer to, to kind of some recent relational contract models. Um, all right. Okay. So uh, what's nice about this is that it's actually going to produce, uh, first of all, it's going to yield an estimating equation that we can take directly to the data. Um, but, um, and then of course, it's going to give us predictions on exactly what should, what should determine the transfers, right? So we can have this estimated equation of transfers as a function of the gap in our absenteeisms, right? So that the kind of efficient transfer, so half the gap. Uh, and what we're going to find is of course that, you know, the, the number of workers, uh, borrowed should be increasing in the, the gap between us in that data hat. Um, the number of workers borrowed should be decreasing in the transaction cost, um, and, uh, and the, the number of workers should be uh, increasing in the maturity of our relationship or in our prior about the, the partner's uh, reliability, right? And we can, you know, we're gonna have different empirical analogs for this. So, so by the way, the, this can all work on the extensive margin as well, right? So the same predictions hold on the probability of any borrowing as opposed to kind of the number of, bar, uh, number of workers borrowing. Um, and then we're gonna have kind of empirical analogs for, for each of these objects, right? So the absenteeism we have in and of itself and, and can match the functional form directly. For the maturity of the relationship, we can see, for example, to date, how many days uh, any pair of, of managers have, have transacted, have transferred workers in either direction. Um, for transaction costs, we can have their physical distance in the factory. So, uh, so either you know, on the same floor, their physical distance, or you know, for robustness, we can just think about, okay, well, what about if they're on different floors? Um, and then we can have these kind of demographic similarities we talked about, right? So are they of different gender? 
Are they different education levels? Um, and then kind of what's the gap in absolute value in the age or, or tenure of the managers, right? Um, okay, so what we're gonna see is, um, you know, and so by the way, this, this actually, this equation is gonna look very much like a gravity style equation, right? We're gonna take it to the data in this kind of dyadic structure, right? So we're gonna have all these pairs and, and the realized absenteeism of each uh, on a given day. And then we're gonna see the flows of, of, of workers between them. So we're gonna, you know, in, in the main results, we just focus on this kind of one, it's symmetric, so this one case, right? I is borrowing when I's absenteeism is greater than J's. You know, we can actually, in the data, we can just, we can use the all, all data points and, and get roughly the same thing. But, um, and so we're gonna follow the kind of gravity uh, empirical uh, approach here. Um, so we're going to use, if for this, for number of workers, when we're using the intensive margin, we're going to do PPML to deal with the fact that a lot of these pairs are going to be non-trading on any given day. Um, we're going to uh, include manager I and manager J fixed effects, right? So the analog of like country I, country J in, in a gravity style equation. Um, we are also going to include, let's say in columns two and three, we're going to include some time control. So year, month, day, week fixed effects to deal with uh, any seasonality in absenteeism and productivity. Um, and then we can, uh, you know, this is more relevant for our setting, but we can also include kind of learning by doing type controls. So in other, in other uh, studies, we've shown that, you know, uh, productivity is a function of, of uh, the days, you know, since, uh, since that particular style started being produced on this line. Um, and so we can just control for that to make sure that that's not kind of uh, conflating anything that's going on here. Um, and what we find is that, you know, the, the relationship is really uh, responsive to absenteeism, the gap in absenteeism. So suppose a, a, a manager, you know, is borrowing, let's say, one worker from three potential partners, as an example, at, at some baseline amount of uh, absenteeism or baseline gap between them. Well, if that gap between uh, this one manager and their three potential partners grows uh, by five percentage points, um, they're going to borrow one more worker in total. So, so 34%, but across, you know, each of these three managers, right? So in total, they were borrowing three workers before, and now they're going to borrow four in some sense, in total on average. Um, we also find that the relationship, uh, you know, uh, let's say a manager is in a relationship that's older by a month, well, then they're going to borrow one more worker every day from that one month more mature relationship. Um, and then we're also going to find that, uh, you know, these demographic differences or these identity-based kind of uh, transaction costs are also going to matter. Um, for example, a manager is going to borrow 60% less from a potential partner of a different gender, uh, or 16% less from a, a, a partner that's of a different uh, education level. Okay. Anant, can I can I actually ask you a question about that? Please. So, do you find that um, manager characteristics predict worker characteristics? So, for example, do women hire more women, and is part of the reason? a male manager less likely to hire, borrow from a female manager because they or their workers don't want to have women great. on the line? Great, great, great question. All of the hiring and allocation here is looks heavily decentralized. So that we know for a fact that hiring is centralized. It's by an HR team. It has nothing to do with any line. So what the way this works is that a line says, oh, you know, I've had some attrition or, or you know, I'm, I'm operating with two or three less workers. So they register kind of a need with HR. And HR runs this process. So they look at who they're recruiting from rural training centers or, or uh, who has kind of come in and applied for a job. And then they kind of fill these needs on a first come first serve basis. So all of that is to say that empirically, we see this kind of uh, tremendously balanced effect on uh, balanced pop composition on uh, demographics. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so, okay, now armed with, um, with these estimates, we can do you know, some, some simulations now to think about, well, we know, look, there's some trading happening. We know there's not the maximum amount of trading happening. Um, and we also know that the fact that there is not the maximum amount of, effect, uh, not maximum amount of productivity happening is, a, uh, sorry, uh, uh, trading happening is affecting productivity. So now the question is, well, how much would productivity improve if we were able to amplify trading in some way, or maybe alternately, if absenteeism were a bit less of a problem, right? So what we can do is we can estimate exactly that production function I've showed you in a couple of different ways, um, uh, calibrate that, and then we can draw 100 days uh, from the data set. 
Um, and then for each of those days, we can see what the absenteeism was for every line uh, and then kind of run some counterfactual simulation. So we can amplify trading So for example, or restrict trading, right? So for example, we can say, let's draw these 100 days. Let's look at what absenteeism is. And then let's ignore what all the shuffling was, right? Let's put everyone back to their home line and say whoever showed up that day uh, had to work on their home line. Well, what we find is that if we undo whatever equilibrium amounts of redistribution is happening, we would lose about a percent, almost a percent in productivity. Um, if on the other hand, we said, well, we know that there's probably, there's more trading that could have happened, right? So if instead we say, look, let's take this data, let's take the absenteeism, and then let's, and then let's see you know, what reshuffling happened. And then from there say, well, okay, now let's see which line stands to gain uh, the most from one additional worker. And then which line stands to lose the least? We'll lose the least from losing one, sharing one, sparing one worker. Um, and then let's make that trade. And then let's keep doing that until the net gains of, of trade are exhausted. Um, well, if we do that exercise and we get this kind of full redistribution, uh, we find that productivity would go from the status quo amount of, of, of trading uh, up to uh, by, by more than one and a half percent in productivity. Alternatively, what if we said, okay, the trading itself, you know, uh, might be, uh, we, we know that there seem to be some transaction costs and so on. What if we just go to the root of the problem and we say, look, absenteeism is obviously just too high here. And maybe we try to drive down absenteeism with some sort of uh, high powered incentive. Um, well, what's interesting here is that if you, if you ignore trading, if you don't actually allow the redistribution and I have absenteeism, which is probably uh, almost impossible to do, but certainly costly to do, um, you actually, you gain 1% in productivity, but that's less than, for example, if you left absenteeism at its high, kind of crazy high levels and just let everybody kind of redistribute maximally. Um, on the other hand, you can get three times or more than three times as much extra productivity if you both cut absenteeism, but then make sure that that, that extra, those extra workers that show up get, get redistributed or reallocated properly in terms of, right? Um, another way we like to think about this is to say, well, okay, maybe none of those things are realistic, right? Maximum redistribution maybe is unrealistic. Um, and having absenteeism obviously seems unrealistic in the sense that this is a really large firm with, with uh, uh, you know, relatively sophisticated uh, activities and still can't seem to kind of drive absenteeism down. Um, so instead, what if we think about just the kind of transaction cost stuff, right? What if we, we tried to, let's say, drive down the effect of the distance transaction cost, maybe by uh, creating some sort of app that allows the transactions to happen much more quickly. You can register your need, you can see who else has some despair and, and kind of transact this much faster in those first five, 10 minutes of the day. Um, well, if we drive down the, the transaction cost, that distance transaction cost, we're gonna get almost 1% in productivity. Um, if on the other hand, we drive down the demographic distances, let's say we just reorganize the lines such that on a factory floor, um, you know, all the supervisors are of the same kind of demographic, uh, you know, they're kind of more homogeneous. Well, that actually would increase productivity by about one and a half percent. Um, so, uh, here on this next slide, we can see what that means, right? So, you know, one and a half percent is almost, it's like $1.3 million annually, uh, in profit not in revenue and profit. Um, and so that's a substantial amount of money that the firm should be willing to invest in doing some of these types of exercises, right? Um, one other way we like to think about this is to say, well, you know, what if, you know, we, what if we took the observed amount of transacting as, as is in some sense, you know, we might actually not be fully modeling what the transaction costs. They might be distance and demographics, but maybe more than that. And so, um, what if we just said, look, we know that you've got these kind of three active partnerships, right? Remember we said you've got 20 potential partnerships uh, or more, but you're only actively trading with two to three. So let's, what if we just take the amount of kind of uh, trading intensity that we see for your three main partnerships um, and, we, uh, and we just make three more look like those three active ones or six more look like those three. Well, on the right here, we can trace that out basically. And what we see is that um, you know, you can get, you know, a, a quarter of a percent in productivity just from doubling the number of main partners, just from going three to six, right? Um, and if you take it out to its logical limit and you make all potential partners look as active uh, as, as your three active partnerships, that's not full redistribution. But what, it, what we see is that you can get, you know, two thirds of full redistribution just by doing that. 
right? Just by trying to kind of encourage activity amongst these inactive partnerships, right? So all of this is to say, um, you know, what, what, do we, what do we learn here? Um, well, we, to, to start with, we first learned that idiosyncratic absenteeism is a kind of major problem in this type of workplace. Um, and that it generates this internal misallocation of labor because that, that the, the absenteeism is so idiosyncratic, it's so uncorrelated in, in kind of even within floor date that there really is all of this kind of misallocation of labor. Uh, and that, you know, th that that misallocation of labor does in fact impact productivity in, in a meaningful way. Um, now, what we see is, of course, that managers are partially reallocating amongst themselves by lending and borrowing, um, but as a model of relational contracts in which there are kind of transaction costs and trust has to evolve and so on, um, there's going to be a limit to this. And it's going to limit in equilibrium, uh, on average, the kind of optimal uh, uh, redistribution much lower than, uh, sorry, the, the, the redistribution to lower than optimal levels. Um, the simulation just showed that, well, if we were somehow able to achieve full redistribution, you could generate one and a half million dollars annually in profit, um, not by hiring more workers, not by you know paying them really heavily to come, come to work, but just by using whoever is showing up uh, more efficiently. You can get one and a half million dollars, but, but um, you, know, you can get a third of that just by expanding the set of active partners from let's say three to nine. So there are these kind of inframarginal bits that we can do just by trying to encourage a few more active partnerships, we can get, you know, maybe half a million uh, in profit annually. Um, yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Anand. We have um, eight or nine minutes for questions and discussion. So I'm going to ask folks to um, raise their hand. Um, uh, it looks like uh, Rudy Yaksik has a question. Please go ahead. Rudy. Uh, okay, we'll we'll come back to you. Um, it looks like the Raj, you also have your hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah, just just a clarification. Um, given that you've estimated this the production function okay given that that has been done what is the role being played by a behavioral model to arrive at at these uh, various scenarios that you chalked out that's the part i couldn't follow what's the role that the model is playing oh in in the simulations yeah because no, so I, I actually don't yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, so we're, we're not really using the model for the simulation. So the model, the model really just tells us, okay, um, here's, you know, how much, you know, maturity of the relationship should matter. Or here's why there are one, you know, one or two main trading partners, but the rest are not uh, trading as actively. Or here's why specific types of transaction costs work. Um, it really gives us really the, the form of the, of the estimating equation, which is this kind of the amount of transfers as a function of the efficient transfer and then these extra costs and kind of what that form should be, um, what the signs of those things should be, which maybe we are all very intuitive. Um, but when we get to the simulations, we actually don't need the model anymore. When we get to the simulations, we just, like you said, trace out the production function and then can can draw the data, see who's where, who showed up, and then just kind of move them around. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Rudy, it looks like you have- Yes, your I think I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, to broaden the perspective, uh, have you asked managers if they would agree to replace this informal allocation mechanism with a, for example, a Vickery uh, second price auction? It'd be a daily auction every morning. And for example, a well informed manager um, who perhaps had no uh, absenteeism is willing to sell their lowest productive uh, worker if the uh, manager who need, who need who has a vacancy is willing to pay a, a daily wage greater than the uh, marginal product of the least productive worker right. and moreover the manager the form manager um, would be doing this subject to achieving the bonus constraint that they would face and if in that particular situation um, the um, perhaps the general manager there may be some global optimization 
in terms of changing the bonus amount so that you have an optimal matching globally? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, there's a lot. There was a lot there. Um, so I think you're you're on exactly the right track, which I which I think we're very fascinated in doing. So I think there's a couple of different bits of play here. Um, changing the incentive structure we've been trying to do for like you know try to introduce a couple of different ideas for like ten years, and that's not that easy to do. They somehow they're they're kind of really uh, stuck on on these obviously inefficient structures they've got. Um, but I do think that there is an appetite for improving the kind of market structure uh, and, and maybe the efficiency. So I think that I think that managers, when we talk to them, I think there is a sense that, oh, surge costs are high. So like uh, they kind of, they don't even, when they talk to us, they say, oh yeah, I just go to the, to the person on my floor or the person nearby, the person I usually trade with. And the odds are, if that person says, no, you don't have time to then ask two, three, four more people, um, and so I do think that they're, they're aware and salient, you know, that, that the kind of surge cost or transaction cost at the beginning of the day is salient, that time cost. Um, we have not asked them kind of about a specific type of technology yet. So I'm actually not, I don't know what the answer is. I don't think it's trivially, trivially yes, that if we said, here's a WhatsApp group, or here's a dashboard that, that allows you to register excess and, and, uh, and, and you register need and so on whether they would buy into that. I think that's an open question that we want to actually explore um, uh, because I think there's cultural norms. There might be some, I think they all, they do kind of feel that trust uh, seriously. So that I don't know if they want, if they would buy in fully to the anonymity of, of the of a kind of centralized market, but, but it's worth uh, talking to them about. It's something we've been thinking about. Morgan Thank Hardy also, also has a question. Morgan, go ahead. Yeah, so I wanted, I was asking a little bit about this in the chat, but I wanted to hear your thoughts on it. So um, one, one other explanation, or, you know, maybe there's trust uh, issues going on, but also another reason you might have a full centralizing system is if there's not perfect substitutability between workers and these managers have kind of more specific or private information about the unique skill sets of each worker, which I think is a great explanation 100%. for why this is hard to centralize. And then I'm wondering how you think that would map onto, well, A, can you look for evidence of that? Do you have data on that? And B, yep. what does that mean for your ideas about these apps or these markets? Because I think if you have imperfect information, and, and yeah, okay, go. So, go so, so I mentioned briefly uh, that, that we can actually kind of write down an, uh, uh, an alternative version of the model where we have this kind of quality of worker bit, right? That like, I've got good, you know, good and bad workers. And some people might, I, I might think that my, that my partner is going to give me the good workers, but they might not, or I might worry that they're going to give me the bad workers and, and try to masquerade them. We can actually do that in the data. So we can test a lot of what this looks like by just a crude version of this, by just saying, okay, here are high efficiency, high, high efficiency workers and low efficiency workers. And what we find in the data is that, um, you know, it, it's, it's pretty interesting that basically, you know, I'm actually more uh, willing to trade on average, willing to trade my low efficiency workers, right? So uh, I'm very responsive with my low efficiency workers, um, but that all of those transaction costs matter a lot more for the trading of high efficiency workers, right? So I actually, like, you know, uh, if, if you're a closer by manager, if we've been working uh, together for longer, we have a more mature relationship, then, I'm, then all of that affects or amplifies my trading of high efficiency workers more than just low efficiency workers. And I think that that plays into exactly what you're saying, which is that the trust stuff works in a similar way, which is that I'm not, I'm not willing to spare my low efficiency workers if I don't know if this person's gonna do the same for me. But after we've kind of been transacting for a while, um, I, I start to respond a lot more with exactly those good workers. Um, now, the second part of your question, I think is exactly right, which is that the second we started thinking about, hey, what's this next experiment we can run, uh, you know, with exactly like, let's do a WhatsApp group or let's figure out, let's code up a dashboard or something. Um, it does start to immediately come against this kind of idea of like, well, how many dimensions of or characteristics of the workers do we have to put there? The most important thing is you have to actually, we've abstracted away from here, but you have to say whether that worker has ever done the operation you've been doing. Um, some of that gets solved because I can trade you a worker and then you can figure out how best to use them, right? You're not just asking, like, we're not actually just asking for one specific worker to do one specific operation that often. We're usually saying, I need one worker, they are A grade. And then if you can't spare exactly the worker I want, I still have some recourse. I can still rejigger and, and figure out how to make use of it. Um, but I do think all of that stuff kind of plays in almost immediately. I'm just trying to think about how the operation is. And we have time for one last question. Abhijit, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, uh, so I mean, I think the, this is fascinating, but I, I feel that we, like in many cases, I think we, when we default to some 
model where you know information is you know too hard to use i, I think it, it, some description would have helped because i i, I don't you know they are working together. There are not that many of them. The lines are next to each other. This is daily experience. I mean, uh, I I am always struck by, you know, the, you know, as Debraj I think said the day before yesterday. It's true that cooperation can fail because we know that they're bad equilibria. But it, but it's otherwise. I find it still puzzling that you know all the opportunities that you know just simple rules of thumb we would help uh, it's not you you said that maybe they don't have a time to ask other people but how long does it take i mean i ask you i shout across do you have an extra worker and you say no i mean i i, I think the information structure that you put on to have the model run i find that um, I, I suspect there is something else that's preventing uh, optimization and not just some uh, here is here's the information structure. So, so I, I, uh, yeah, I know I, I'm sensitive exactly, I think, to what you're saying. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I just want to clarify a couple of points. So I totally agree with you. If you're on the same floor with this line, it shouldn't be that hard for me to yell across. And actually, that's what we see, right? You're totally trading with the and trading pretty intensively with the manager that's adjacent to you in any direction, left, right, front, back. You're trading way more than you are with two lines away. Now, two lines away here could be 50 feet, and, and it might actually take some time. And the point is you might go probably some stuff that's outside of our model sequentially in your search, right? You start close by, and only if you can't get the worker, you keep going. But all of that takes time. Um, the other bit is that, like, as we mentioned, like if you have to go downstairs uh, or two floors down or three floors down, um, I think that actually is a substantial amount of time. So what we're seeing is that we have like these timestamp data. Right? So what we see is that workers actually trickle in slowly up until 5, 10, 15 minutes, even after one production is supposed to start. And so whether it's worth me going down when I actually have to do, there's actually a lot that I have to do at the beginning of the day. I have to see, for example, what was the work in progress last week? I mean, last last day, uh, you know, uh, is my order new today? Do I need to change some calibration on the machines? So it's more that I've got this other stuff, span of control stuff to do as well, you know? Um, but, but so I think that you have to take it to its limit in some sense. Well, do I have to go downstairs? And am I that comfortable, for example, talking with somebody who doesn't speak the same language as me or talking with someone who is a woman when I've never really had a working relationship with a woman or vice versa, talking with somebody who's a man and they've never really been that nice to me. Um, so I think, I don't think we have fully described the transaction costs all, at all. I think our in intention was to give you examples of types of transaction costs and indeed find that those that those do it. Um, but I think that there are more transaction costs here, a substantial one that kind of play into this span of time, span of control bit at the beginning of the day. Fair enough. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Anand, so much for this fascinating presentation. And I think Thank we will you. close the session there. Excellent. We're going to move on directly to the second session. Um, Seelan Anderson is going to chair. Okay, great. Um, uh, Eduardo, I think, is presenting, are you? Yes. So Eduardo uh, Montero is going to present the paper on market structure and extortions in El Salvador. And uh, I presume uh, uh, some of the co-authors will respond in the chat. Yeah, awesome. So thank you guys so much for giving us the opportunity to present this, this project. We're really excited to get your guys' feedback. Um, so this is joint with Zach Brown, Carlos schmidt Palilla, and Mika Sviatsky, and they're all in the chat right now actually attending. So they'll be answering your guys' questions. Um, so thanks to them, my awesome co-authors. So this paper is really about understanding gang competition and extortion, because gang violence and associated extortion is a central development challenge that affects millions worldwide. Today, we're going to be focusing on the case of El Salvador, where extortion is actually by far the main revenue source for these gangs. And it's estimated that about 70% of firms in El Salvador pay extortion. And so given this development challenge, governments have attempted many policies to try to limit the negative consequences. And a particularly common and controversial policy is for governments to try to facilitate cooperation between gangs to reduce competition and reduce gang violence. However, little is known how, about how gang competition matters for extortion, and consumer prices or other downstream effects. And the main challenge here, of course, is that it's very difficult to measure extortion, as you guys can all imagine, especially systematically. It's illegal, 
is difficult to observe and it's actually rarely reported to the police, especially in El Salvador where people don't really trust the state that much to act on these extortion reports. So this is meant that we don't have a ton of evidence on some of the economics of extortion. So how do gangs determine their extortion rates? How does gang competition matter for extortion? And then ultimately, what are the downstream effects of extortion and who bears the incidence? So what we do in this paper to provide some evidence is we leverage data from a leading wholesale distributor in El Salvador that has very detailed data on their sales for a number of deliveries, but also uniquely has the location and payment amount for over 50,000 extortion incidents that they recorded over the period of 2012 to 2019, where their trucks were required to pay extortion in order to make a delivery in a gang controlled area. So it's kind of like rights to deliver in an area. So this is just an example of the firm's business in one single day. So we're showing you two types of stops, stops where they just made a delivery and stops where they made a delivery, but also had to pay extortion in order to make the delivery. The second thing we take advantage of is this 2016 non-aggression pact between gangs in El Salvador. I'll talk about this in a, in a minute, but there's been a couple incidents in El Salvador's history where gangs have done truces um, and it's pretty well known that they reduce violence. So the 2012 truce that I'll talk about in 2016 truce, but little is known about how it affects extortion. We focus on 2016 just for, for data reasons. And so what do we find in the paper? So we start off with just a very simple question, which is how do gangs actually determine their extortion rates? We build a simple model that highlights how gang competition matters in the market for extortion and show empirical evidence consistent with gangs price discriminating but that this price discrimination is a bit constrained by how much they know about the firm. So they use more local characteristics to set their extortion prices. The second thing we do is ask, how does gang competition affect extortion? The model implies that cooperation will, between gangs will lead to an increase in extortion. When we look at the non-aggression pact, we see that extortion increased by about 19% in places that had previous gang competition compared to places without previous gang competition. And then we shed some light on what are the downstream effects of extortion. We find pretty substantial pass-through of extortion to retailers, especially for the retailers very close to places where extortion must be paid. We use very detailed data from pharmaceuticals, and we also show that the non-aggression pact increased pharmaceutical prices, and it also increased hospital admissions for associated diseases where drug adherence was important and was affected by these prices. And so we hope to contribute to sort of three literatures here. The first is this literature on government corruption and bribery and competition for bribery. Second on, is on gangs, um, especially there's been a lot of work on drug gangs, but there's been a bit less work on competition for extortion between gangs. And that's where we think we're kind of coming in with some, some evidence. And they're also thinking about just the effect of collusion more broadly. Here thinking about an illegal market where gangs are competing using violence. And we'll show that has pretty interesting implications. So let me just first provide some background on gang violence and extortion in El Salvador. So El Salvador is known, it's actually often, often referred to as the most violent peacetime country in the world. In 2015, for example, it had the highest homicide rate in the entire world. And this is largely due to two gangs, MS-13 and Barrio 18. Together, they account for about 87% of gang membership and gangs are present in almost all of the municipalities of El Salvador. And a lot of this violence can be traced back to extortion. Extortion is called the economic engine behind these gangs and behind the violence. And this is because the gangs fight and compete for territory. When they control the territory, they can then extort firms in that territory. But they also use violence directly to collect extortion. And today we'll be talking about a transportation and distribution firm. These are often firms that are very subject to a lot of extortion in El Salvador. And this is because the gangs require trucks to pay extortion in order to conduct business in an area or make a delivery. So these payments are often described as the rights to deliver in an area rather than kind of the rights to pass through an area. They're not really tolls. Um, these trucks are often stopped on side streets really close to the delivery location rather than on main roads or main highways. They're not really stopped on the main roads. Something else that's important about extortion in El Salvador and these distribution firms is that the distributors don't have a lot of option on who to pay. They generally just pay one gang when, they, when they're making a delivery. This is because gangs here have exclusive control of territory. And so what gangs are really doing is they're competing over territory rather than directly competing to provide quote unquote protection, um, 
you know, in, in return for some extortion. They're not really competing on, on the price of extortion and what they're getting in return. And so a natural question is, why do these firms pay this extortion? Well, you can see it's very costly not to pay this extortion in some instances. These things can kind of escalate. So an example of a bread truck that was lit on fire by the gangs because it wasn't paying the extortion it was supposed to pay. And in El Salvador, there's been a couple very notorious instances of gang cooperation. Most famously and controversially, there was a government negotiated truce in March 2012, where the government got together with the two main gangs, negotiated this pact in 2012. It's well known that violence dropped sharply following that, but the truce fell apart shortly thereafter due to growing opposition, both from the you know, civilians and other politicians. It was very unpopular. Uh, people felt you shouldn't be negotiating with these gangs, a number of other things. But the gangs kept, especially the gang leaders, kept meeting. And in 2016, they, together, without the help of the government, negotiated a non-aggression pact in April 2016, where they agreed not to fight and compete with each other for existing territory, sort of respect each other's boundaries. So it's well known that this cooperation in both these instances drastically reduced gang violence, but little is known about what happened to extortion, prices, consumers in these areas. Some have speculated, though, that this cooperation between gangs does lead to an increase in extortion. And the theory here is that this, these truces just basically allow these two gangs more breathing room for their operations, their extortion operations, their main revenue source. And this is because accounts suggest that it's particularly costly for gangs to both collect extortion and fight the rival gang to defend their territory or try to take over territory. Gangs in El Salvador have limited resources and not particularly kind of well off or wealthy. Collecting extortion on its own is costly. You know, sometimes you have to light trucks on fire, but it's especially costly when gang members are targeted by rival gangs. And so this is why it's particularly costly to do both and why perhaps the truce allowed them to specialize more on extortion. One other thing that's important about this context is that Salvadorians largely believe these truces benefit the gangs. They're very unpopular. And so here we kind of hope to understand a little bit more of why that might be the case. Okay, so let me just talk a little. Oh. Eduardo, do you mind taking a question from Oh, um, sorry, thank you. Um, uh, clarification, is there some um, useful service that comes with extortion like protection from theft? And if so, is there reasons for us to believe that nat natural monopoly would be a good state of things? Um, so the question was, is there survey evidence on extortion? And so there's oh. a little bit of it, but it's- um, No, no, so, Eduardo, let me, let me try again. I think you yeah. uh, wasn't clear. Um, is there good reason to believe that uh, there's some valuable service that comes along with the extortion payments? Oh, a service that comes with, the got it, got it. Um, so in our conversations with the firm, and I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit, it doesn't seem like they're getting this protection from other gangs or violence or, or some useful servi like services. And so we don't really think that they're providing kind of important protection that the firm values. Um, Mika and Carlos have really great work with Nikita Melnikov, also highlighting that these gangs in El Salvador don't really provide a lot of public goods or things like that. They're really like extracting extortion is the way it's described in El Salvador. So, let me turn now to the data we use. So we use extortion payment and sales data from a leading wholesale distributor that covers 2012, 2019. This firm is a major supplier in El Salvador of both consumer products and pharmaceuticals. And their business model is that they buy these goods in bulk, often from abroad, and resell them to local retailers and pharmaceuticals. For the distribution you know, across El Salvador, the company subcontracts drivers and trucks and it makes these trucks be bare of visible advertisement or company identification. And they must leave and return to the warehouse each day. This is kind of to ensure driver safety and kind of not call attention to these trucks. So over the sample period, the data covers over 90,000 trips and over 2 million deliveries to a retailer or pharmacy. So how does extortion work for this firm in particular? This firm is interesting because it has a very robust security team that monitors these trucks so calls in, checks in on them, and they directly negotiate with the gangs. This might seem weird, you know, from an outside perspective, but actually it's a very common approach in El Salvador. A lot of firms have security teams that monitor trucks, negotiate with gangs, keep track, make sure that their drivers are safe. So it's quite common. 
And so the extortion payments for this firm worked as follows. Prior to making a delivery in a gang controlled territory, the driver will meet with a gang representative who's in charge of collecting extortion. The driver then calls the security team, puts the phone, you know, gives the phone to the gang representative. They negotiate, confirm some amount, and then all three parties confirm receipt of payment. In some cases, the security team will pre-negotiate an amount for a given period. So sometimes bi-weekly, sometimes monthly, but never longer than that. And so the security team emphasized to us that this system is, is very good because it really ensures the safety of the drivers and it potentially reduces fraud by, by the drivers as well. So they actually like check up a lot on these payments, make sure that they're correct because it matters ultimately for their bottom line. They have strong incentives to collect good extortion data. One other thing that's important to highlight is that the distributor has reported these extortion payments to the attorney general's office. All this data, you know, the government has it too. Uh, and so we, you know, collected all this data and look at it. And here, just showing you a map of El Salvador, kind of highlighting the geography of extortion. And it shows that extortion is very spread out across El Salvador. Of course, it's most concentrated in large cities and urban areas, but these trucks have to pay extortion making deliveries in a lot of different places. So the data contains over 50,000 extortion incidents. The other thing to highlight is that the extortion amounts vary a lot too. So there's a large variation in the extortion payments. The individual payments you know, can be as low as 50 cents, um, as high as $140. On average, they're about $7 per, per delivery. And so the average truck in a given day ends up paying about $14. That might not seem like a lot, but for, for a Salvador, it's a lot. It's, roughly equal to the half the daily labor cost of a truck driver. So it's a considerable you know, daily expenditure too for this firm. So what we do is we combine their sales data with the extortion data using information on the truck, the route, and the location. And to start off, we're just gonna show you some descriptive evidence. So what, what things are correlated with the extortion amount, focusing on the value of the nearest sale. So first looking at price discrimination, we find that extortion is increasing in the delivery value but not so much in the value of the truck. So figure A is showing you on the y-axis, the amount of extortion paid on the x-axis, the value being delivered. And we see that there is this increasing relationship here. So extortion is higher for more valuable deliveries. Something that's interesting that the firm pointed out to us and that we verified in the data is that extortion isn't really correlated with kind of the value of goods in the truck or the value of deliveries being made elsewhere by the firm. Gangs don't really know that they actually often or actually they said they don't do this. They don't look inside the truck to see how much product is in there. They kind of look at other things like, where's the delivery happening? Um, how rich is the retailer that they're delivering? Things like that. It's kind of these local characteristics a proxy for the value of their deliveries. Consistent with that, we also show that extortion is positively correlated with proxies for, for downstream demand. So things like night lights, so how rich a municipality is or how much gets delivered there by the firm. Extortion is increasing in these things, consistent with price discrimination. Another thing we show, you know, descriptively in the cross section, is that extortion is actually positively correlated with gang violence and gang competition. So here, looking at homicides, extortion is increasing in, in the number of homicides. You know, perhaps there's more gangs there, but also in kind of the share of homicides committed by one of the major gangs. And so we see that extortion is highest in places where these gangs are kind of committing 50-50 or so of the homicides in the cross section. And so we find evidence that gangs price discriminate in terms of setting extortion, some evidence of third degree price discrimination. We also show in the cross section, extortion is positively correlated with gang violence and competition. But of course, there's a ton of omitted variables with this cross sectional evidence, right? There's some omitted variable that might determine both extortion and gang competition, in particular things like downstream demand, how valuable is that territory to control? And in fact, the causal effect might go in the opposite direction. So to guide the empirical analysis, what we do is you know, just set up a very simple model asking, what are the consequences of gangs going from competition to collusion on things like extortion by the gangs and then the downstream prices that the firm charges? Sorry, Eduardo, before yeah. you get into the model, there's a bit of confusion. Maybe Delete could ask his question. Delete, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the question was: I thought the mechanism is on the cost side, 
that uh, <clears throat> if you're not fighting with your rival gang for territory, then you have more people to allocate to extortion activity. But there could be a standard IO based uh, effect based on demand substitution because trucks and firms may decide where to uh, allocate their sales depending on what they're paying for extortion. So I'm just wondering whether this latter, uh, this latter channel is, is going to be operating. Yeah, so we'll, we'll look at that and talk about this kind of alternative explanation that it's, it's about kind of changes in the demand or value to deliver somewhere. Um, definitely look at like, extensive margin of places where they deliver. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but yeah. But you're right about this mechanism that we wanna flag. Um, so let me, let me go through the model and then we'll talk about it when we talk about our results. And if it's still unclear, please ask again and, and we'll, we'll discuss there. So we build a simple model to guide the empirical analysis where these gangs are modeled as an upstream duopolis charging extortion to downstream monopolists. So they're kind of inserting themselves in this vertical chain. The gangs are just identical in the model playing a repeated game. The downstream firm here is selling a homogenous good with marginal cost normalized to zero with a demand alpha minus beta price in each period. So extortion from the firm side is happens as follows. So a gang that controls the territory share S can sell protection. But what this means is that gangs apply an extortion rate of E to the quantity delivered in the territory share S. So this is kind of consistent with the descriptive analysis. Extortion is increasing in the quantity being delivered. There's price discrimination. And so given extortion, the firm's you know, first order condition is, is pretty simple. Prices are increasing in extortion, quantities decreasing. The more interesting part though is understanding the gang's problem. So what the gangs are doing is choosing violence and an extortion rate. We model them as playing an alternating moves game for territory where the territory share is increasing in how much violence they choose, but they're decreasing returns to scale to controlling you know, larger territory. And then the gang cost though is increasing in both violence and extortion. Both these things are costly on their own, but that there's diseconomies of scope. As Dilip just talked about, it's kind of costly, extra costly to do both these things. So the gangs are maximizing kind of their extortion revenue net of this gang cost. And so we compare two equilibrium, one where they're competing so gangs are maximizing profits and competing for territory. And one where they're kind of colluding, where the gangs split territory and then maximize profits. And the model has three predictions. So the first, and this is well known already, is that you know, collusion decreases violence between gangs. It has another nice prediction, which is that violence is higher in places where underlying demand is higher, which is what we see in the descriptive uh, portion. But the model has kind of two more predictions that we don't have a lot of evidence on, which is first, what happens to extortion? So we find that under collusion, extortion is gonna increase and it's gonna increase relatively more in places where demand is higher. We also have predictions for what happens to the price charged by the firm. And we see that collusion increases prices that consumers will ultimately face. So now we turn to testing these kind of predictions by exploiting the 2016 non-aggression pact and we exploit two sources of variation in a difference in difference framework. So first is kind of the unexpected timing of the 2016 non-aggression pact. So firms and you know, citizens didn't know these negotiations were happening and the timing was pretty unexpected. The second thing is cross-sectional variation in the, the degree of gang competition prior to the pact. So it's a very simple difference in difference model where we're including municipality fixed effects, time fixed effects. Uh, non-aggression is equal to one in the periods following April 2016, months here. And then competition is a variable equal to one if a municipality had gang competition prior to the pact. Now, how do we define that? Of course, gang competition is something that's you know, very hard to you know, measure. What we do to proxy for gang competition is use very detailed police reports on homicides where they can often determine who was responsible for each homicide. And the intuition here is just if both gangs are committing homicides in an area, that's a pretty clear proxy for gangs are ultimately competing there for something. More specifically, what we do is we construct the herfindahl hirschman index using the share of homicides committed by each gang, looking at the period of three years prior to the non-aggression pact. So before you know, this non-aggression pact. For baseline specifications, we set this variable equal to zero if, if this HHI is in the top quartile, one otherwise, but we show robustness to a number of alternative cutoffs, 
uh, the results are actually quite similar and then continuous measures. So just directly using the HHI and the difference in difference model and show similar results too. We also show that this index is correlated with other measures of competition you might think about. So one that we use is the share of inmates in prison from each of these gangs from a municipality. And our measure is super correlated with that too. So we think it's kind of capturing gang competition. But to kind of further validate this measure, we look at homicides splitting these areas by places with gang competition and places kind of with low or without gang competition. Looking at all homicides in figure A, homicides done by these two main gangs, and then homicides where they were the victims. And so we find that the non-aggression pact you know, does decrease violence in these places, but differentially so in places where there was competition. So most of the drop is coming from places where there was gang competition, kind of consistent with what we're trying to pick up with these measures of competition. We also interestingly find though that non-gang crime levels more generally aren't really affected. So what's really affected here is violence across gangs, so they're no longer kind of fighting each other. But overall crime levels kind of stay the same. So thinking about things like petty theft, property crime, domestic violence, other things, those all kind of stay the same in these places. So it's really picking up gang violence and gang competition in our view. Eduardo, would you like to take another uh, clarifying question by Ben, Ben yeah. Olkin? Totally. Yeah, sure. I feel like we've gone a little bit back and forth with this exchange with mm. Philip and, and also in the model as to what you are what you're arguing is the main story. Like it seems like it's like as in the model went by very fast, but I thought the understanding was that basically there is there is some elasticity between between you know where where the the trucking firms can decide who to pay, and that's why that's what allows kind of the um, in the non in the non-aggression period that's what allows them to compete and drive down the prices. So I thought that was your story, but then there's some of the response in the chat said no 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 the firms have to go there the firms are totally inelastic, but if the firms are totally inelastic, then I don't understand why. The competition would be affecting the prices. So, can you just clarify? Like, is that the story, or or is there some other story about a demand shock? Like, it was just a little unclear to me. Totally, yeah, yeah. So, I, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna talk about it here, but let me just talk about it right now. So, why might extortion increase when gangs collude? So, the qualitative evidence and the conceptual framework really highlight. And I'm, I was, I knew this was gonna blow up the chat, but it's really about the gang side diseconomies of scope. So, the idea here is that in a municipality prior to the pack gangs are both fighting each other and collecting extortion and there's diseconomies of scope you, you have to like devote resources to do both these things but following the pact when the gangs are colluding they no longer have to worry about fighting and they can devote more resources to extortion so sending more you know gang members to intimidate the firm to pay more or keeping up with payments things like that but of course there's like a number of alternative explanations i think the one you brought up right now adila brought up the first one and then you brought up the third one which is Perhaps there's this, it's like kind of mechanical. There's those firm choice following the pact, right? So something that's interesting, we thought about that too. And that was actually one of the first things we were thinking about here. It, but conversations with the firm really highlight that firms can't choose which gangs they're paying. They don't play them off each other to drive down the price. Instead, the firms just have to pay who's ever in control of the territory at that given time. And so they don't really have this choice of like negotiating the price down. And actually we, have data from 2019 from the firm where they did keep track of which gang they were paying. And we never see that for a uh, delivery, they're paying both gangs. It's pretty kind of, they're only paying one gang at a time, if that makes sense. That's not a great check because that's post the extortion or post the pact, et cetera. But the, more important is the conversations with the firm really highlighting that they can't really choose who to pay and they're, they're not really playing the gangs off each other. If that makes sense. So we think it's- No, no but the question them. is they could choose, I thought the idea was they could choose where to go or like, Oh, I see, I see. They can choose where to go. Yeah, so that's not that's not quite in the model right now. But when we talk about kind of the effects of the firm, we're looking at the, a municipality level, which is kind of a large level, right? Including municipality fixed effects. So we're, we're still seeing that they're going to these municipalities and extortion is increasing. It is true, perhaps they're going to some retailers less. And so we'll think about that when we look at the retailer level data. But, but even if they could choose, why isn't that just a downward sloping demand curve? Can't you just more, isn't that a downward sloping, like I could go to another territory? So the firm could choose to deliver somewhere else? Yeah, suppose they could. That would just come across as a downward sloping demand curve and you're just trying to uh, achieve collusion in that repeated oligopoly game, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, got it. So I think one thing that's outside the model, but it's, it's really nice point, which is that 
basically there's a cap on how much extortion the, the gangs can, can do, right? So there's two ways the firms can adjust. So if extortion's too high, they could just go somewhere else. The other thing though, is that they can also arm themselves and send guards. So I think in some ways that's a bit outside the model, but it kind of constrains the amount of extortion that these gangs can do. Cause there's a firm response there too. Like you're highlighting, they could just choose not to deliver in an area, which is something that they definitely do if extortion is too high. Um, or they can, um, you know, arm themselves, which they, the firm actually did prior to 2012, but they, they decided that was too costly and set up this system instead. So that's a bit outside the model, but that is, that is one margin where firms are adjusting something that, I want to highlight here though is that extortion is a very local thing and ga the gangs don't have a ton of information it seems like about where else the firm is making their deliveries so they're really like if a truck comes it's like oh you're delivering a lot pay us but they're not like oh we heard that you delivered a lot in this other municipality so let's increase extortion here or something like that it doesn't seem like the gangs are that well informed it's a pretty the gang structure is pretty decentralized Um, let me just, I think I jumped ahead, but let me just walk through these extortion results and then I can stop on these alternative explanations. I think that's super interesting and important. Sorry, so, Eduardo, the, sorry, just before you go on, there is a question I uh, raised hand by Dilip. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm just saying that the firms could, you know, the, the, the gangs by deciding what rates to charge, uh, what, one way that the firms could respond is just by switching their uh, activity. And so the gangs are aware that if they drop their extortion rate in one territory, then they're going to attract more business. Yeah. And this is just a very simple way for firms to react instead of, you know, fighting back or anything like that. Yeah. So on the equilibrium part, you know, you may still get, you know, people not changing where they go uh, as the, you know, with and without collusion, but that's just off the equilibrium part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the way we would think about that is that that's kind of a constraint on the extortion extortion rate everywhere. So like if they set extortion too high, the firms won't deliver, which is definitely something that happens. So empirically, we're looking at holding the municipalities fixed and looking at kind of the amount of extortion in those areas. But it is true that they might deliver less in these areas. So we don't really see a response on that side when we look at kind of the trends in the number of deliveries made in municipalities affected. So it doesn't seem like this non-aggression pact is causing the firm to make fewer deliveries in places with higher extortion. In fact, they don't really respond on that margin. They respond more on the price margin that I'll talk about a bit later. But you're totally right. Like that is something that constrains the, the amount of extortion that these gangs are charging. And it is another way that these gangs could, um, or sorry, these firms could, could respond. Yeah, and you could probably estimate the demand, the cross demand elasticities, right? In the standard IO way. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely. We, we should think about doing that more, more sort of um, directly. Something I, I skipped past really quickly is something we see is that, like, if we look at the number of payments a route has to do, we don't really see that being correlated with the extortion amount, which is something you kind of would expect if there's a lot of information about what else is happening along the routes. The gangs don't really know the truck routes. Um, that's, that's like firm information. That's not information that the gangs have. And I think so these information, this lack of information on the gang side is something that kind of constraints. Um, they're not acting like a totally optimal, like spatial maximizer in the general equilibrium. They're kind of like maximizing at a very local level. But yeah, that's a very good point. We'll, we'll think about that more carefully. Um, okay, so let me return to this, uh, even though I previewed this already, is that collusion between these gangs led to an increase of about 20% in extortion. We can look at it kind of by period, and we see that prior to the pact, they were on similar trends, you know, somewhat suggestively, and then after the pact, we see this increase in extortion. So this is kind of validating some of the assumptions behind the difference in difference and just visualizing the time pattern of the effects. Something else we do is we look at heterogeneous effects on extortion, looking at kind of municipality characteristics, the richer ones versus the not rich ones. And we see that gangs increase extortion most in the regions where the downstream demand is higher. So just really highlighting that this downstream demand is really important for how gangs react to things like collusion, uh, consistent with the model. So again, we're showing that collusion increases extortion rates we're not really seeing evidence of an extensive margin effect um, in terms of the number of payments that the firm has to do, but the firm has already extorted a lot. Like they have to pay a lot of extortion or they're stopped a lot in these places. 
So we think that there wasn't that much margin for this particular firm to be affected on the extensive margin. Uh, we show a number of extensions, such as looking at the results with, with alternative cutoffs, find very similar estimates, both in, in the magnitude and significance. We look at a continuous treatment, and we find that um, if a municipality were to go from fully a duopoly to fully collusive in terms of the gangs there, extortion would increase 30 to 50 percent. And then we also kind of replicate the analysis at the Canton level. So you might think that a municipality is like not the right unit to think about gang competition. It's even more local because we do think it's like a very local phenomenon. We replicate the results at the Canton level and we find very similar point estimates, both in terms of like the magnitudes and the significance. And so this is the, I think the key question that's come up a little bit, which is why, what's the mechanism here and what are alternative explanations? So we've really highlighted this gang side this economy is a scope. It's difficult to do both extort and fight your gang, fight the other gang. We look at other explanations. And so this, I think this is a key one, which is perhaps there was this like peace demand boom, right? So the idea here is that if gangs are no longer fighting, it's safer there. And so then there's more demand by consumers for, for products. They feel safer. There's going to be this demand boom. So we look at that, looking at a number of outcomes like household incomes, household expenditures, the value of the products being delivered by the firm, night lights, and we find no effect. The point estimates are all really small. But one caveat here is that here we're looking at kind of short run effects. It is possible that these truces might lead to de higher demand in the longer run once people think that they are credible or are going to hold. So that's a possibility, but it just seems like for the results here, they can't really be explained by this peace demand boom. Um, the second story is that they are getting this protection and perhaps after the pact, there's like more property crime. So the firm is demanding more quote unquote protection, but we find little evidence, like I said earlier, that the, the non-aggression pact affected, you know, other crime. And then I've already talked about this, but here the firm can't really, doesn't really play off the gangs off each other. Instead, it kind of just pays whichever gang is in control of the territory. So let's talk through kind of what are the downstream consequences of extortion? So here we're using two approaches and two, very, two different types of data, each with their kind of pro and con. So the first is to just use the distributor's data directly. The nice thing about this data is it has a large variety of consumer goods that can be linked to extortion payments. The downside is that we don't have prices from the firm. Instead, what we observe is the revenue and the procurement cost. Another downside is that we only have one firm, right? So to supplement this data and this approach, we use pharmacy sales data where we do observe prices we can link it to health outcomes, and it's telling us the response of multiple firms to this non-aggression pact. The downside is perhaps it's a smaller segment of goods. So first, let me just walk through the results looking at the what we call the distributor margin. So this is the difference between the revenue and the procurement cost for a given product. From the perspective of the retailer, you can kind of think about it as a delivery fee for a given product. And so first, in column two, looking at the reduced form effect on this distribution margin, focusing on the nearest sale, we find that collusion between gangs leads to a 12% increase in the distributor margin faced by retailers, the ones closest to extortion payments. We also think about other kind of um, radii around these extortion payments, so one kilometer, five kilometer, find similar effects. And we do find that this pass-through is, it kind of dissipates spatially, which is interesting. It's, it's again, kind of a pretty local phenomenon. We also show results looking at a instrumental variable difference and difference model where we try to instrument for the amount of extortion in an area with this non-aggression times competition, just to try to put a number on the pass-through. And we find that a, every $1 increase in extortion increases the delivery fee or the distributor margin by about 83 cents. Again, though, you have to be really careful interpreting these IV models just because of the exclusion restriction, a lot of other things can be happening. The paper, we do a number of falsifications and other things, but just be careful looking at this. So we're gonna focus a little bit on the reduced form and thinking about heterogeneity in the, in the pass-through is something we can do because we have very detailed data on the product type. So we have things like staple foods, non-staple foods, cleaning supplies, toiletries, um, health products. So when we look at the extortion charged, we find no heterogeneous increase in extortion amounts by the product type. Consistent with the, the gang not really knowing or pricing things based on the product, it's more of this looking at these observables, like how much is being delivered, how nice is the pharmacy, other things like that, or the grocery store. When we look at kind of the, the margin, this distributor margin, we do see heterogeneous adjustments by the firm, kind of suggestive evidence of larger increases 
for more inelastic products like staple foods. So this might have important implications for things like poverty in these areas, you know, poor places or poor households depend more on these staple foods and they're seeing their prices go up more following the non-aggression pact. But again, we complement some of this data using very detailed and rich data on pharmaceuticals. So we use data on pharmacy sales um, and as I love, it actually has amongst the highest drug prices in Central America. And people point this out a lot, potentially reduces access to drugs and affects the health of, of the population. So we got data from the National Director of Medicines that covers the period 2014, 2017, contains information on the quantity and revenue by pharmacy for over 10,000 pharmaceutical products. And we standardize across different sizes, et cetera, to look at things as products as the molecule brand at the molecule brand level by at pharmacies. So here we're looking at the prices of pharmaceuticals. Column one and two looking at you know, all pharmacies. We see that gang collusion resulted in an 8% increase in retail prices for pharmaceuticals in these areas that were affected by the non-aggression pact. So where gangs were previously competing and were now colluding. Columns three and four look at the pharmacies supplied by the distribution firm. And we see kind of similar results there. And then finally, we look at drugs for managing chronic diagnoses. And so for these, we see that prices increased by 7%. So these are you know, diseases or diagnoses like diabetes, um, asthma, you know, heart disease, hypertension, high blood pressure, things like where we think that drug adherence is very important. Here, we also see that their prices increase. And so that made us think like, well, what happens to the health of the consumers in these areas? And so we wanted to explore this question. We used individual level data on admissions to public health facilities, also provided by the government, that covers public health facilities. So this actually is not the full set of hospitals in El Salvador, but it covers the majority of people because private, the private sector here doesn't cover that many people. It's only about 5% of the country. And this data uh, contains information on hospital where people were admitted, the municipality, the admin state, characteristics and importantly diagnoses for the hospital admissions. And so we turn to looking at the effect of this non-aggression pact on health. We see that when we first look at all hospital admissions, we don't really see an effect. There's no general increase in hospital admissions due to the scan collusion. We look at injuries also, we see not much there, perhaps a negative. We were expecting something there perhaps because of the gang violence you know, going away. But then when we look at the, the chronic conditions that I talked about previously when we're using the pharmaceutical data, we see that the non-aggression pact, this gang collusion, seem to have increased hospital admissions for these conditions by about 9%. So this suggests to us that consumer health is also negatively impacted by this gang collusion through higher prices due to extortion. Um, we think it's kind of an a new result here thinking about the effect of downstream effects of extortion on consumers and consumer well-being. And so let me just summarize, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions that my, you can see my co-authors are furiously chatting. Um, what, we hope, what we think we do in this paper is we ask this question, what, what are the effects of gang competition on extortion and downstream effects? And it's because in countries with organized crime, governments have often facilitated cooperation between criminal organizations to reduce violence little is known on kind of the other consequences of these truces. So we show here is that this gang cooperation allows them to increase their extortion rates. They get more breathing room, they can increase their extortion rates. And this extortion increase is then passed through to retailers and consumers. So there's a little bit of this double marginalization going on here. And so consumers are bearing a large burden from the upstream extortion. And also just taking a step back, we think that we're providing some insights into the economics of gangs, especially in places where extortion is a very important revenue source for gangs. We find evidence that they price discriminate. Um, and we also argue that violence and the incentives for violence are really closely tied to the economic incentives of the gangs, in this case, kind of the extortion revenue. And so ultimately what we hope to, to show here is that the market structure for extortion, the competition for extortion and the market for extortion may be important for policies. So thinking about how do we address extortion? Um, should we target some goods over others like staple foods where it seems like they're most affected 
by extortion or pharmaceutical prices, other things like that. So trying to provide a fuller picture of how extortion and game competition uh, are you know, intertwined. And so that's actually all for me. So thank you. Uh, we're really happy to take some questions and get some feedback on this. Okay, thanks so much, Eduardo. Um, there's quite a few questions still in the chat as well, but if anyone wants to raise their hand, but um, Abhijit, ben, would you like to go? There's quite a few questions from you. Uh, so I guess um, mostly I wanted to know, I mean, you know, how, what, how plausible is it? I, mean, I assume you're dismissing it, but uh, so you don't think it's plausible. The story that, you know, people, you don't, you may not see a, a big demand effect, but people might just, you know, or aggregate demand effect, but people might relax when you, you know, the gang violence is down, they relax. Uh, I don't know whether anybody's ever looked at the general buyer mood effects on the elasticity of demand. You could imagine people saying, okay, look, these are very cheap goods. I was, go I was about to go without some medicine that I need. Um, they're not very expensive. Um, do I uh, do I really forego them now? Maybe I'm a bit more optimistic. I, you know, mm. the elasticity could change. I mean, for things that you seem to look at, I would say the less, you know, things like asthma medicine and diabetes medicine, these are very, very cheap. So, you know, uh, you could imagine a, a small shift in, in people's mood could have effects on the, on the demand elasticity. Yeah, no, that's a super interesting story. And we hadn't really thought about that. Um, yeah, I could, yeah that's, a, that's a really interesting point. We have to think about how to test that. I think one thing we were thinking about is looking at, this doesn't totally get at it, but it's, um, these, these truces were really unpopular, but it'd be interesting to get survey data on how people view these truces and see if they, ha they are more happy and optimistic, especially in these places where violence seems to be reduced. Overall, we have general survey data that tells us that people were not happy with these truces. Um, at the individual level, people thought the gangs were extorting much more uh, that was going on. And so it's not from the anecdotal evidence, which you know might not be super complete, is it seems like people don't feel this like optimism burst because of these truces. In some ways they feel upset, either because like morally they find it wrong to negotiate with the gangs that are kind of controlling their lives, or because like they're actually having to pay more extortion directly, their mobility is more limited, other things. But we should definitely check that because that's a very interesting alternative story we never thought about. Thank you. Uh, Esther, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I was wondering if you have data about uh, civilian murders, because you see a huge decline in, uh, in murders, but if most of the murders before were gang members, it's possible that along with the increase in extortion, you actually have an increase in murders of non-gang members. Um, yeah. That's a super, super good question. And, and we kind of, that, that's very plausible too, because the gangs okay. are still using violence to enforce extortion, limit mobility, other things like that. The thing, data-wise, we can't really disentangle, you know, not civilian murders. It's, you know, they tell it, we could look at that, but oftentimes what happens is if there's a violence, or sorry, a homicide, the police try to determine what, gang was involved but sometimes they're not able to even if it was a gang violence gang murder so um because sometimes they like these gangs like kill the family members of gang members for example so in that case it's a bit tricky but i, I agree i think that's one thing we don't want to make that statement necessarily but that seems very plausible to us with the data we have that like they reduce gang on gang violence but other things like property theft or other theft that affects consumers or civilian well-being didn't seem to change and their prices went up they had to pay more extortion and so it doesn't seem, it, it could be the case that just consumers don't really benefit or civilians don't benefit from the reduction in violence overall. But yeah, we, we can't really test that. That'd be super cool. Uh, Debraj, would you like to go next? Yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to go back to the first part of your paper again, just to understand uh, uh, with respect to Dilip's comment. So the, the, the standard oligopoly story would be something like this, that there are a bunch of gangs, they're divvying up a, a global territory, and uh, they are currently in some sort of punishment equilibrium mm -hmm. because they were maybe charging lower rates in order to get more business coming through their uh, territory. And the non-aggression pact is just like a cheap 
coordination device to revert back to the collusive equilibrium. Now, am I right in understanding that that's the, that's the story that you're telling here? I understand that there's an additional wrinkle about uh, diverting resources from, uh, you know, within, from extortion to, to, to punishment of rival gangs. But modulo that, is this the story that you have in mind? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's very much the story we have in mind. And so, yeah, I think you put it better than we did. So we should we should incorporate that, right? No, that's okay, fine. But if that's the story you have in mind, okay, yes. then let's go back to the case of uh, your inelastic demand curve, right? Uh, you know, this, and let's say people can't change territories, they have to drive through the same territory, okay? So now in the typical collusive story, there's a notion of what constitutes a deviation, right? Like when one gang, uh, what do you have in mind with the vertical demand curve? Does one gang undercut another gang to what end? They're not getting more business that way. Yeah, um, we think about the undercutting happening in terms of like they're expand changing the boundaries a little bit. Um, like right, so the lip story in that sense is central in, in, in the sense that a downward sloping demand by by you know by by changing the local volume of traffic yeah. into your territory, right? Yeah, that's how you have a deviation in the first place, right? Yeah, right, right. right. So, what we'll, we have to emphasize much more and make it more central here is just we don't seem to see changes in the kind of the number of deliveries made by the firm. It doesn't seem like that's one. On main... equilibrium, you won't see it. Yeah, that's fair. That's a good point. Um, yeah, that's a tricky. That's a good point, and we'll have to think about that much more carefully um, and how it fits into our story. So, no, no, I appreciate that comment totally. Yeah. Um, Isabella, you had a suggestion. Did you want to in the chat? No? <laughs> No, uh, Dean, did you want to say what you were talking about in the chat? Or right, here's a question. Go ahead, Andrian. Andrian. Um, I was just going to ask um, what the role of police enforcement is here. So when they start co colluding with each other, um, is there police corruption in this context? Do they also collude with the police? Why don't the police do anything when these rates of extortion skyrocket? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, two, two things on that. So definitely there's a, a setting where the police corruption, there's other things like that, uh, the, the government extorts people too. Um, I think the reason for that is kind of a very political one. It's very salient to look at homicides dropping and then the government can kind of claim that they're keeping people safe. So it's kind of a, a political reward story that the police is like, oh, these gangs are cooperating, violence is down, therefore we're doing a great job. It doesn't seem like the police is very responsive to extortion requests. It's, it's kind of hard to fight extortion. Um, and so that's what we see, you see in surveys done in Isabel that like under 10% of people report extortion. And then people who are subject to multiple extortion over time, like this firm, under 3% of them report it to the government. So that's another thing is just people are kind of like low state capacity, they don't really trust the state, it's not really reported. So it's not even clear that like the police, even before this is responsive to extortion, they might not have the capacity, they might be corrupt, they might just be more focused on this headline number of violence going down. Um, so all these things are definitely factoring in. Something that's interesting in, in the model, in the paper, I didn't talk about it here, is that like, um, you can like put in something like poli police enforcement and the model implies that actually higher police enforcement is going to lead to gangs to more likely to go to a collusive environment too. And so that's another thing to factor in is like, as it becomes, there's more and more violence, either because the gangs are fighting or there's like this third party police, you know, increasing violence on the gangs, the gangs have a higher, higher incentive to then collude too. So it could actually kind of the model highlights this, this is not a central part of our story, but that police enforcement can actually backfire and lead to gangs to actually collude more. So that could be going on. We, we don't know. But. Can I ask a follow-up question? To really just, so you said that a relatively small fraction of people report getting extorted. So your evidence on the extortion is from one firm, right? Do you think that, so do you think that after the pact, they continue to extort more from 
specific firms that they already had like an extortionary relationship with, but like in terms of what happens to net extortion with other firms, like do we have a sense of like how how do we know that there's a net increase in terms of like the overall extortion relationships that are happening, including with other firms? Yeah, no, that's that's a very good question. So yeah, it's definitely here important things that we can empirically look at only one firm. Um, anecdotally, it does. There are accounts like we were just talking about an article that came out recently in Osaba that talks about extortion going up during COVID. Um, and it's, it does seem like gangs do kind of expand their reach. There's some survey evidence that we can look at in Salvador about, about this. The, there's like a Fusada survey, and it does seem to show that gangs potentially increase kind of the, the firms that they're extorting. But that, that's relying on survey data. It's not systematic. Um, it's not something we can speak to. But anecdotally, in the little survey evidence we have, it does seem like they do expand their operations to extort other firms, too. Uh, Dilip, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I think the uh, the, the really big question is the uh, overall welfare effect on, let's say, households and civilians. And so there's a trade-off between the the violence and the and the and the prices. Let's say. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's any way to tease out the net effect by looking at uh, the extent to which rents in different neighborhoods may have changed. I don't know to what extent people are have the option of moving across neighborhoods. You know, changing where they live. I guess tenants might do that. Uh, uh, and I guess there's heterogeneous effects, right? So some some areas, some neighborhoods were more subject to competition where this effect was more intense. And most of the goods in question are local. And I, I don't know to what extent the civilians were caught in the crossfire uh, yeah. between the gang members. So uh, anyway, is that something that you could look at? Yeah, that'd be really interesting. So just on, specifically on, on rents, unfortunately, like, in Salabawad is a setting where the gangs also limit the mobility of the people who live in their territories because they also charge extortion from them. So their mobility is very limited. And, you know, in fact, that, Mika and Carlos have a great paper on that. So it's not clear that it's like a fluid market in that sense. Um, people are, in fact, after the, the non-aggression pact, people are probably le even less likely to move because the gangs are more able to control their movement and mobility, which it seems like that happens in terms of prior work by Mika and Carlos. And so it's not clear we could use extortion. So it's, and that's something that we, we, we wouldn't be able to capture right now, but we could think about is like, that's another negative consequence of this collusion is just, it might've reduced the mobility of people internally as well. Um, so it's just, it's tough to get at like this welfare cost is something we've kind of backed away from doing a little bit because we're kind of shedding light on extortion and prices, but there's a number of other things that gangs are doing that are really bad for consumers. I think Esther's point was really good. Like maybe violence didn't change overall um but also kind of your point about mobility it kind of actually might have led to more restrictions on mobility the gangs increasing their control and it might have also had these political effects where the gangs are now seen as more legitimate and have more power negotiating with the government which is something people bring up so it's just like there's so many possible negative consequences uh it's hard to kind of neatly you know give a welfare calculation there but here we think we're just kind of providing some initial evidence trying to get at that Uh, Hoyt, uh, would you like to ask a question? Sure, yes, please. Um, so you're, um, you have this demand curve that is mostly about what people, the, the way that people respond to the extortion is that they just buy less of the product from which it's being, the transport is being extorted. But I wonder whether any of your implications would be different if there was a response directly to the extortion. You, you mentioned the transit company used to have armed guards. Now it doesn't. You could imagine other protect, protective actions that people might engage in to avoid extortion, yeah. um, et cetera. So, so if the if the thing is not, you have the price of the good is kind of like a sufficient statistic, and I'm uh, I'm not sure that the, that's quite right since there are more than one dimension of response. Yeah, I'm not, I don't think we're saying that the price is a sufficient statistic. So something important that we need to understand as well because it affects consumers. Um, it is definitely the case that you, we can enrich the model and think about this of like firm responses in terms of upping violence. Uh, we can think about how that affects. In some ways, like I mentioned earlier, that already kind of is partly a reason why extortion isn't way, way higher. It's firms can choose to fight back and they often do. Like there's a 
One distribution firm in El Salvador that is known for refusing to pay extortion, but they have to incur these massive costs like they're bulletproof their trucks, they all then have armed guards. Um, so it is a strategy. It seems like for this firm, it's, it's not the equivalent strategy, but um, we could think about incorporating that into the model and, and thinking about how firm responses. We, my sense is that just puts a cap on how much extortion the gangs can, can charge. Um, depending on how costly it is or other things. But yeah, that's something that definitely definitely um, occurs. Well, it's, it's not just a cap. It's also, a, it, there's an externality in the sense that if, if I try to extort more, it, it increases the uh, up arming of the firms, which yep. is bad for the other gang. Yeah, it's bad for the other gang. That's true. Um, it's also bad for me, but that, that's true. Like, you can enrich the model thinking about that. Um, in some ways, it's, yeah, this is kind of like not, we're, we're already thinking about extortion on its own being costly. Perhaps for that reason, as extortion gets higher, it's a very simple like linear increase in extortion, but like as extortion gets higher, perhaps it's just costlier to kind of, the costs at the firm, of the firm responding get, you know, are increased. As you charge more extortion, it's more likely that, you know, if I'm being charged extortion as a firm, it's really high, I'm more likely than armor my trucks. And so that's a cost. And, you know, it's somewhat discontinuous perhaps, but um, we're just thinking about it linearly for now, but that is, in some ways in the model, but just in a very um, simple way. But yeah. Devraj, do you have another question? I just wanted to follow up on what Hoyt said, which I think is very interesting because there you can think of two types of deviations from collusion, right? One is by extorting less and the other is by wanting to extort more, right? And the one he's talking about, you extort more and that creates externalities. You would also extort less and create externalities in the way that we were talking about earlier, right? Yeah. So, but then that would suggest that the non-cooperative equilibrium without collusion in Hoyt's world, right? Would involve a lot of cross-gang violence is true, but generally extortion would have to go up in the non-cooperative equilibrium, right? Because that's the direction of the deviation, right? Yeah. Whereas in your world, extortion goes up in the collusive equilibrium. So it, it might say something about dif differentiating Hoyt's view from, from, let's say, Dilip's view. That's a really good point. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, that has kind of different implications depending on the competition. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much to everybody and to Eduardo. Um, so I think that's the end of this session. So we have one last paper to, that will start at um, 1.30 Eastern time. And I, I think there is also a social during the break between 12.30 and 1.30. Uh, so thanks very much. Thank you, guys. Okay, we, we might as well uh, get started. This is the, 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 the anchor segment of, of the conference. So I wanna thank everyone for, for staying with us. Uh, just a couple of quick thank yous for me, um, because I suspect at the end people will disappear uh, back into the ether. So uh, of course, uh, thanks to my uh, fellow members of the um, organizing committee, Siwan Anderson, Andrula Dubé, Rohini Pandey, Debraj Ray, and Martin Rotenberg both here at NYU and uh, Mika Sviatsky. Um, it was a lot of fun putting this together. Uh, and also many thanks to uh, the DRI staff and our graduate student volunteers, Andrea Pepito and Aditi Gautam, many of whom uh, I think all of you would have heard from them at some point, but of course uh, our graduate student volunteers uh, today, it's Isabel uh, Zacher and um, Minu Philip, uh, but we've had um, excellent graduate students throughout uh, diligently uh, managing the chat. So th thanks to everyone uh, who did that. And so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jonathan Mordock, who's going to chair the final session, uh, and he'll set the ground rules. Great. Um, the paper now is um, by Nina Bookman, Pascaline Dupas, and Roberto Zipparo. Uh, Pascaline is going to be presenting investment decisions with endogenous budget share allocations inside the household. And um, Pascaline, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And uh, since I'm the last uh, speaker, first, uh, thank you so much uh, uh, to NYU for organizing the conference. Rajiv uh, has been wonderful. Thank you to you and DRI and the whole crew. Thank you to the committee for selecting our paper and for selecting a wonderful program. Um, so this, this work is joined with, with Nina uh, and Roberta. 
uh, who are absolutely amazing, and they are here. Um, they've, uh, they are amazing because they've, uh, you know, they, they are fabulous uh, to work with. They are very smart and very fun, but uh, they also agreed to do the toughest job, which is to manage the chat. So I'm doing the easy part, which is to present, and they are going to do the tough part, which is to deal with, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 all the questions. From the last two days, I feel like, uh, you know, answering questions on the chat is like being in the trenches. So I'm, I'm glad to, to, to avoid that. Um, and uh, let me start with a little bit of a, a teaser, uh, since everybody is tired and maybe you need to, you know, uh, get something a little bit uh, exciting. And it's a bread conference after all, so I'm going to talk about sourdough bread. Okay, so imagine that you have a partner uh, who is uh, going to the uh, department store to, to, to buy, you know, necessities, and then he or she comes back with a sourdough bread maker. I'm very excited about it. Um, but then um, it, uses it, it uses it once and, and never again, okay? And then two months later, I says, uh, hey, um, I should get a yogurt maker. Okay, so what's your reaction? Okay, <laughs> my reaction would be like, really? Yeah, sure. I think the bread maker needs a friend at the back of the you know cupboard for unused items. <laughs> now, if the partner anticipates that reaction, you know, he may want to actually use the bread maker once in a while, just to you know prevent you know, <laughs> me from having that as an ammunition. Okay, to prevent me from being able to nag him about not using the stuff. Okay, so that means that you know he may end up using the bread maker even if you know he realized after one use that the bread maker is not that great, just to avoid uh, having you know, giving me the chance uh, to complain about that. Now, if the cost of using the bread maker uh, you know, is, 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 is too high when the bread maker is actually not great. Um, then the partner should anticipate that as well and not in, by the bread maker in the first place, okay? So these are two, the two key intuitions at the root of this paper. The idea that there is some, you know, dynamic reputation within the household that are gonna matter and they can lead to what we call the intra-household sunk cost fallacy, which is that you may use products even though they turn out to be lemons just to kind of like save space but also uh, it may deter investment sometimes, okay? So, so that's, that was um, the introduction. Now, you know, despite the fact that this is a bread conference, you may still wonder uh, what, this, what it has to do with development. So, you know, in the development context, you tend to have imbalance, you know, within the household, even more so uh, than in, in a richer context. With a lot of specialization within the household, women often in childbearing, uh, child rearing and home production while, while the men make money. So in such context, the woman is gonna rely on transfers from the husband, okay? And uh, the key question is what drives the side of such transfers and what drives how much discretion women have over how to spend these transfers. So, you know, all family now with existing household models that, you know, uh, you know and, and the empirical tests that have, you know, focused uh, a lot on the outside option, okay? Which determines my bargaining power. Um, what we want to add to this is the, the idea that maybe uh, how much um, discretion women have, how much access they have to uh, you know, discretionary resources is going to be uh, a function of our spouse belief about our ability to manage such resources. Okay, so that's what we do in this paper. We bring to light this reputation dynamics within the household, both theoretically and empirically. So we're going to, uh, you know, essentially, you know, use this intuition. Uh, it's not going to matter for sourdough and, and, and yogurt makers because in, in, in the context we're going to be looking at, which is you know, for the uh, empirical application, which is Malawi, these are not items that are relevant. Um, but the, the core idea that if you purchase a lemon today, it damages your reputation as a good budget manager. And so we're going to show that this is going to lead to these two phenomena, underinvestment in products with uncertain returns and overuse of lemons. Um, so, you know, and, uh, to, to, to save face, okay? So we got excited about this initially because it was a way to rationalize um, something akin to the sun cost fallacy uh, without any uh, needing any you know, you know, behavioral um, trick. Um, and again, you know, we think that this, this type of mechanisms, these type of dynamic uh, uh, reputation mechanisms are not specific uh, to uh, lower income con con countries. We think you, know, they, uh, you, 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 you can uh, hypothesize or conjecture about the extent to which you are driven by you know, uh, you know, our own lives. Uh, but we think that in low-income countries uh, where lab women's labor income is low and the overall you know, budget size is, is tight, um, this can actually have important implications. And in particular, it could explain why uh, uh, previous literature has found that women were often the target 
of um, interventions by NGOs or social marketing to try to convince them to invest in new technologies uh, seem to underinvest. Um, and also why maybe they have lower returns to capital if taking risk um, is, 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 is uh, you know, also costly uh, because of this reputation mechanism. And so this idea that there could be strategic interactions in the household is, is not new. There's a lot of papers showing evidence of strategic saving, uh, you know, willingness to, to, to pay to hide resources to avoid sharing with a spouse. Um, the one uh, type of um, dynamic reputation mechanism that we've seen within the household is, is between parents and children. There's this is, uh, a series of paper uh, by Juan Pantano and, and co-authors uh, thinking about the fact that parents may strategically uh, punish their older children uh, quite a bit to establish a reputation as being tough to deter later ones from, from misbehaving. Um, so that the, the one instance of, of, of this uh, kind of like reputation um, within the household. But what we're gonna be thinking about is, is um, very similar actually to what has been shown in the literature uh, on reputation incentives for managers inside the firm, okay? So the fact that uh, 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 if you've, you've invested in, in, uh, in something as a manager, uh, you may wanna keep going to save face is gonna be uh, you know, very similar to, to, to what we show here, except the difference that in the firm, the, the loss to the firm are not, you know, does not, um, are not, are not uh, you know, paid by the, by the manager, but in our case, uh, we're gonna see the extent to which the, the, the wife um, and the household welfare more generally are gonna be affected. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna look at this reputation concerns uh, between husband and wife, but you could actually apply more broadly. Uh, you can think of the model we're gonna have as also mattering between a parent and a teenage kid. Um, you know, you give you, uh, you know, give pocket money to your child, but if they start doing all sorts of bad stuff, uh, you're going to stop giving them. Um, or even between a, a, a migrant uh, who is sending remittances home uh, and the family uh, back home. So we'll, we'll start, we'll have spend about half of the presentation on, on, the, on the, or maybe you know, 40% of the presentation uh, on, on the model, which is gonna, it's gonna be a dynamic signaling model of women's expertise in, in the household. And we're gonna look at uh, the evolution of, of reputation, reputation and how this matters for investment choices. And then we're gonna test the model. And so we designed three experiments uh, in Malawi in order to test specific predictions of the model, okay? and so. We're gonna to have to ask you to bear with us a little bit because you know, since we designed the experiments to test very specific predictions, you know, these are not like um, kind of like plain vanilla, uh, you know, RCTs, if you will, they require a little bit of, uh, of, of paying attention. So, you know, if you're like me and you have a hard time following the chat at the same time as a presentation, uh, you may wanna like hold off uh, and hold, uh, on, on the chat and like uh, focus on the presentation because this the experiment design is a little bit um, specific. And so we have two experiments that are uh, lab in the fields. So the first is gonna be a transfer experiment where we check kind of like the premise of our model, which is asking whether reputation matters for the share of the budget over which women have control. And then we have a signaling experiment, which we are gonna play with the wives. Um, sorry, in which we, we look at whether wives care about their market expertise reputation. Uh, and in particular, whether the possibility of hiding bad purchases is gonna matter uh, for whether they invest or not. And then we have more of a field experiment, which we call the uh, investment experiment uh, with women uh, at the market, married women at the market. And uh, we check whether you know, the prediction that um, women with market expertise, um, with different level of market expertise uh, end up investing at different, uh, uh, with, you know, with different probabilities um, when reputation is at stake, but not when uh, we remove the reputation mechanism. So let me uh, dive into, uh, into the model. Um, so, you know, we consider a household with two spouses, we call them the husband uh, and the wife. And the wife is depending on, on the husband for transfers. And there are gonna be two types of, of wives, uh, experts and non-experts. And the transfers are valuable to both types of wives, but they're only valuable to the husband if he's married with an expert wife. In other words, the husband's outside option um, is greater than the uh, value he gets from transferring to a non-expert wife, but it's smaller than the value he gets from transferring to an expert wife. Okay, so he likes delegating to the expert wife, um, but not to the non-expert wife. But the asymmetry that he doesn't know the type of the wife uh, the time they uh, you know, get going, uh, the wife knows her type. So uh, wives can invest in a safe or a risky good every, every period. Um, 
And the, you know, the difference between an expert and a non-expert is that the expert learned the productivity of the risky good before she has to make the decision, whereas a non-expert does not, okay? Uh, so in other words, the expert uh, is able to discern between what's gonna be a, a good versus, uh, a good product versus a lemon. Whereas, you know, the non-expert is, you know, much more gullible. Um, she can be, you know, fooled by the vendor or she's not gonna be able to, you know, to really uh, figure it out, okay? Um, and then the husbands are going to have dates about their wife's type by observing the rate of investment uh, in the risky good um, and the usage uh, of the purchase goods. Okay, so we're going to assume that the husband does not directly observe the productivity of the good. Uh, he can only observe whether or not she buys the risky stuff, uh, you know, once in a while and, and uh, the usage rate. And so we're going to show that there are two equilibria, uh, a pooling equilibrium, which is that's when the usage cost is low. Then uh, the non-experts can kind of you know mimic the behavior of the expert wives, um, and so uh, by, by you know uh, in, in having an investment rate that converges to that of the expert wives, uh, and and they're going to hide whenever they make a bad a bad investment, so the their husband is never going to know um, the type, and uh, if the usage cost is is high, and then I can't really hide uh, bad mistakes. Uh, then you're going to have ultimately a separating equilibrium where the non-expert wives end up being revealed because their investment uh, rate is going to be lower than that uh, of experts. Okay. Uh, so so that, yeah, I had a question early on about the modeling strategy and risk aversion versus risk taking in this model. Deborah, do you want to put that out? Uh, it's okay. We, we we got that in the chat. I was just, it's fine. It's, okay. uh, I, I don't <laughs> want to disturb the flow. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so this was this was like the, you know the preview. Um, so now, if you uh, you know want to know a little bit more of the specifics, so the husband and the wife live for an infinite number of periods. They you know this this you know, interactions happen you know in very high frequency. Uh, the husband controls a, a household income uh, and decides each period whether to transfer a fixed amount omega to the wife. And if the wife receives the transfer, then she has to make two choices. The first one is whether to invest in the risky good or the risky one. So you, know, you go to the market and then you can choose whether you're going to just buy like the regular stuff you know that you usually buy, or uh, uh, whether you're going to use some of the money to you know buy a new product that um, is is being um, you know uh, newly advertised at the market. Say you know a new cook stove that's supposed to be more efficient, or uh, a new type of grain that's supposed to be drought resistant, or something like that. Um, so the same good as productivity eta s, uh, and it's known, and the risky good as productivity eta r with priority lambda, but there is a priority one minus lambda that is a lemon, and so it's not going to uh, be useful at all. So this lambda um, is common knowledge, okay? Uh, so the share of, of, of the risky goods that uh, end up being good. Okay, so every period is a new risky good. Uh, every period is like independent, um, whether it's, 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 it's good or bad, but on average, it's, it's good with priority lambda. And uh, obviously, to make it interesting, uh, you know, the productivity of the risky good when it's good is greater than the safe good. Um, and then the wife has to choose whether to exert effort to use the good. Okay. And here we're going to make it easier for ourselves. Um, you know, for productivity purposes, we're going to say that actually the cost of using the good, if it is non-zero productivity, is zero. And then we're going to focus on C, which is the cost of using the product if it's um, zero productivity. Okay, so the factor is the cost of hiding. Okay, I can pay that cost C to hide uh, that it's a bad product by using it, since my husband does not observe uh, the productivity, it only observes if I use the good. So the goods realized return is, is uh, you know, E, my effort, times the, the return. Okay, and both spouses are going to enjoy the payoffs of the goods at the end of their lives. So now these two types of wives, you know, the expert and non expert. Uh, the you know the, the key difference that I mentioned is when um, they learn about the returns to the product. So the expert wives learn the productivity E and T before deciding to purchase. So they're able to inspect you know the thing, to think about it, to you know draw on uh, you know their expertise to figure out whether it's, it's a lemon or not. But the non-expert wives do not. They only know this this priority lambda. And the population share of wives who are experts. Uh, is, is known to everybody and it's, it's P0, okay? And that's the husband's prior. So as mentioned, the husband does not observe the good's productivity. So he updates his beliefs about the wife's types based on whether she purchases the risky good and whether she uses the good, okay? 
And, and the wife is going to be able to, ha to hide bad purchases by use the, using the good, even when it is not profitable. So the key parameter is going to be this hiding cost, okay? The effort cost of using, uh, of using the bad good. So, you know, think of, uh, uh, as example, you know, if you buy a low quality toothbrush, you know, it's a low usage cost because, okay, it's kind of a, sucks a little bit to have a toothbrush with like, uh, you know, the little thing that fall off as you brush, so, but it's not, you know, it's not terrible. But if you buy a solar oven, that turns out to not be good because, you know, solar oven, in my opinion, are terrible because they take forever to cook and if a you know, cloud comes by, you know, your chicken is ruined. So, you know, that's a huge usage cost. It takes hours and hours to cook with a solar oven. So if it turns out that, you know, you'd rather not use a solar oven, using it just for the sake of saving face is going to be extremely, uh, extremely costly. So again, this, the game structure is the husband decides whether to make a transfer to his wife. Then the wife decides whether to invest in the risky good or the safe good. After buying the good, you know, um, now everybody knows, uh, I mean, sorry, the, uh, the non-expert uh, wife also, um, uh, you know, now learns the exact realization of the productivity of the good and decides whether or not to, to, to exert uh, effort to use it. And then the husband observes the wife's investment decision uh, and the usage of the good and uh, to update his beliefs um, about his wife's type. So P, uh, at time T, P, T, is, you know, the key um, set variable here. Um, it's the reputation uh, stock of the wife at this point in time, okay? And so what we're gonna do is that we're gonna characterize Markov perfected equilibria um, with, with this uh, no, variable PT, okay? So, you know, the first paper this morning might have been into trouble for using Markov equilibria because they actually needed that, uh, the fact that the husband would not, uh, sorry, not the husband in that case, the fact that the manager would not see the whole history um, uh, of other managers um, to explain uh, their results. In our case, actually using the Markov uh, equilibria is, is, is more constraining. If the husband observed the whole history of investment and usage of the wife, then our results are actually easier to, to, to produce. But we are gonna show that even uh, if we assume that the only thing that the husband uh, knows at a point in time is this you know, state variable PT, so the stock of reputation, uh, we are gonna be able to generate uh, separating and putting equilibria, okay? So the interesting case is when um, the non-expert wife ideally, optimally would always invest. So the case where she would you know, take the risk and she would experiment, okay? She would always try the risky good because the return to the risky good in expectation is actually greater than to the safe good, okay? So absent any reputation concerns, she, you'd actually want her to try stuff out. You want her to try the cook stove, you want her to try the bed net, you want her to try the, you know, the chlorine and stuff like that, okay? Uh, and the outside option of the, of the husband, omega, you know, is, is higher than the expected return of the risky good, but lower than the expected return of investing in the risky good only when high returns are high, okay? So that's what I've said before, that the husband wants to transfer, you know, to the expert wife, but not to the non-expert wife. And so if, if, the, if women could not hide, and uh, the husband perfectly observed their wife's type, then he would make a transfer only uh, if matched with an expert wife, okay? So uh, to give you the intuition, I'm not gonna go through you know, all of the proofs and stuff, but just to give you the intuition for the equilibrium strategies. First, we're just gonna limit ourselves to uh, cutoff strategies for the husband, okay? Um, and the intuition uh, you know, there, um, it, we're gonna, the, it, it, if the husband stops making transfers to the wife, then he doesn't you know, learn anything anymore, okay? So once he stops making transfers, this state variable PT is not gonna change anymore. And we're gonna, uh, you know, we can show that uh, it, you're gonna have the value function of the husband who is gonna be um, you know, a, a continuous and increasing function of this uh, variable PT. And so that's gonna imply the existence of a cutoff reputation level P star below which no transfer is made, okay? Now, uh, for the wives, uh, for the expert wife, investing into the risky good when the realization is high and into the safe good when the realization is low is a dominant strategy for the expert wives uh, if her reputation is above the, the, the cutoff, okay? So that means that the expert wife uh, is gonna invest at a, you know, at a rate lambda, okay? And every single period, she has a positive probability of investing, okay? But the non-expert wife does not know the returns of the risky good when she invests. So she's at risk of making two types of errors, type one errors, which is investing in a lemon, 
and uh, type two errors, which is missing out on high returns good. Okay. So the husband, you know, he's, he learns from what he sees. What, what can he see? He can see either that the wife invests in a safe good and uses it, or that she invests in a risky good and doesn't use it, or she invests in a risky good, sorry, uh, risky good and uses it, or risky good and does not use it. Okay. We don't have the case where she invests in a safe good and does not use it because it's, it's, it, it, it's always uh, optimal to, to use a safe good and, uh, and use it. So obviously here, if you see three happen, if the husband sees the wife invest in the risky good but not using the risky good, immediately is that reveal the type of the wife that means she's a non-expert because she made a type one error, okay? So the non-expert wife wants to avoid that, okay? But if she does, if she just invests in a safe good all the time, okay, uh, that's also, that's going to reveal um, that she's a non-expert, since you know the expert invests at the, at the rate uh, lambda, which is greater than zero. So this is the hypothesis should be a zero. Okay. Um, so so you know you don't want to make type one errors, but at the same uh, sorry type, you, you don't want to make uh, uh, type one errors, but you also don't want to not invest. So what can you do? If the usage cost is low, then you can invest in the risky good and use the good to hide your type one errors, okay? But you can't do that all the time. You can't invest all the time because that would also reveal your type because the experts only invest at the red lambda, which is smaller than one, okay? So, so you don't have to have a, 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 mixed, uh, a mixed strategy, okay? And it's a mix of safe and risky that you know, is necessary for them to stay within the possible investment rate of the expert and to maintain their P you know, above, above P star, okay? So you know, I, can, I, can, you know, I can invest in risky and invest in risky, but at some point I'm investing too, you know, uh, too much in risky. My P is going, you know, it, 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 it keeps going down each time I invest in risky because the husband, you know, each time I do something that's like, I do in, in, that the uh, husband expects me to do more than the non-expert, than the expert, uh, that that brings down my P, okay? So, you know, from that, the investment rate of the non-expert um, and the expert are gonna convert through this lambda, okay? That's what the pooling equilibrium. But if the usage cost is high, then hiding type one errors is too costly, okay? So then the optimal strategy uh, for the non-expert wife is to invest in the safe product, uh, you know, as long as possible. What do we mean by that? What she's saying is safe, invest in safe, invest in safe, the husband, each time she invests in safe, uh, you know, kind of like <laughs> downgrades her, and the P goes down, goes down, goes down. At some point, the P is, you know, close to the last, you know, there's the last possible chance. Um, and she, uh, if she invests against in safe, then, you know, she gets below P, P star, and then, you know, she's out. So, you know, in the last kind of like gasp, <laughs> uh, she's gonna, you know, take a shot at it and, and invest in, in, in risky. And if she's lucky, she can, you know, stay in the game. Uh, sorry, if she's lucky, she stays in the game because it was not a lemon, but if, if it's a lemon, then she's, that's game over, okay? So over time, when the usage cost is high, over, you know, you're gonna end up with a separating equilibrium uh, because at some point, uh, the, the investment rate being, you know, uh, too low reveals, reveals the time, okay? Um, so that's, those are the, you know, this is essentially the, the, the two, you know, we have this um, proposition in the paper that says that you're gonna have, um, depending on the usage cost, you know, this pooling on the, on this, um, on this separating. Now in the, the way you think about it is that, you know, there are some goods that are high cost and some goods that are low cost. And so, you know, it, what, how it happens is that depend, if, depending on the share of the good that are, you know, high cost, uh, you may end up, uh, you know, having separation faster uh, or less fast. Okay, so if there are a lot of goods that are very, um, you know, cheap to, to 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 use, and so you can, you know, do this, uh, you know, with this sunk cost, intra-household sunk cost uh, fallacy of, of, of using uh, goods that uh, are lemons, you can stay in the game for quite a while. In some sense, that you can you can you can uh, you can uh, pull for quite a while, but you know, ultimately, if there are some goods that are too high, uh, too costly, too high, you're going to end up. Um, in a separating situation, okay? So what are we gonna take? So this is this is a model. So I can see there are 55, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, chats. So I don't know what they are, but I, maybe I should pause and check with uh, Roberta and Nina if there's anything they wanna bring up uh, to discuss. But, you know, that I, I, I can't follow what's going on in the chat. So am I alone here or is everybody on board? 
Yeah, Pascaline, I, I think it is a good moment just to step back. There have been some really interesting conversations in the chat and Roberta and Nina, feel free to jump in here. Um, I, Ro, Rohini had some interesting comments about observability, which Nina and Roberta responded to, but maybe it's useful to bring them up. And it's related to something that Chris was, Chris Yotri was also mentioning. Sure. So I think, um, I mean, some of it got answered. But I think it's a little bit of a broader question than the model per se, which is, you know, type is a fixed individual characteristic in your model. It seems it's, um, you know, it's costly to not know type, but you're constraining very much the ways in which husband can learn about type and both in terms of they're not doing anything in the marriage market, that's fine, you may want to shut that down, but just the options are really constraining a lot. So I think that was the meta yeah. I think, question. So I think the way the way you I mean I don't know what what Robert and Nina said but hopefully we 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 you know we are aligned but the way I've been thinking about this is is that you you know the, the model assumes just that is you're one or the other type and that's it but it it can be domain specific so you know you can be when it comes to agriculture am I an expert or non a non expert when it comes to health am I an expert or non expert when it comes to uh, child uh, education stuff am I an expert or a non-expert and so you can think of like the transfer that the husband makes could be for each domain there's some transfer that I make and for each domain you know there's this, this, this uncertainty as to the type and so it's not it's not like you're either one or the other for everything uh is that for each specific domain there's this this, this uh, game being played and so you could be you can be an expert in in half of the domain and a non-expert in the other half and the question is, you know, uh, can can the can the can you know the husband wants to before you know he gives you money for agricultural stuff, he wants to to make sure that um, he would like to know if you are an expert there. Yeah. So that's I think that, that's useful. I think that also helps you possibly get more predictions of the kind if it's a domain that's really valuable. So something like agriculture that maybe matters a lot. I'm, the husband may do a lot more to try to figure out type there because it's actually really important to not know type. While maybe something else like a sourdough bread maker, fine, let them just add up. It's in the end, you know, not that costly. So I think I think I think yeah. it's really useful, and I think it's something you should actually maybe think in at least observation yeah. data. You can have some predictions on where type can this game will continue playing areas where it's less likely to hold. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, and this is another like meta point, which is like, you know, why wouldn't the husband just buy the stuff, you know, uh, himself, you know, so it, we're also like look, looking at domains, and maybe this was already written in the chat, I don't know, but we are looking at domains where, uh, we know, where actually the wife has a comparative advantage. Uh, and so, and the husband just doesn't have the time. So he's not gonna, you know, he's, he's not gonna be able to actually, you know, do do do, do that stuff uh, with the Omega is gonna do, you know, if he doesn't transfer it to the wife, he's gonna use it for some other, uh, some other purpose. So we are kind of like focused on domains where the wife has some comparative advantage and, you know, it's gonna be, uh, you know, it's gonna be rated to often, you know, um, home production and children and stuff like that. Hey, Raj? Pascaline, you've been remarkably yeah. abstract about what activity, apart from the sourdough thing, what activity do you have in mind? Can you give us a couple of examples so that I can evaluate the model with it? Yeah, so, for, you know, think of, um, uh, you know, the uh, a social marketing firm comes around the market and try to convince women to buy a new cook stove that's supposed to be, you know, more efficient. Um, and then the wife has to you know, decide whether or not she wants to, to buy that and use some of the money that she has from her mother to buy that um, or not. And then, you know, she brings the cook stove home and then tries it once and then realize, you know, actually it takes, it's more efficient in terms of fuel, but not only in terms of, of time, you know, so like maybe, yeah, I don't need to, to, to use charcoal, but uh, it takes forever to, to, to cook somehow like this, this thing down like too, too, too slow and all this, um, or, or it, it just like alters, uh, you know the the the, the tastes um, of the food too much, and so it's not actually a good idea. So that's kind of like you have to, you know, that, that's the that's the type of of decisions. Or oh, it's like a new, you know, a water filter to make your water clean, and then you you know after you start using, you realize again, you know, it's 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 not very convenient. It takes a long time for the water to go through, and that means that you can't, you know. Right. Uh, so it seems, that's to me the, that, it seems to me the examples that you're considering the disadvantage if there is any in the new technology yeah. has to be a private cost that is incurred by the wife herself mm -hmm. right uh, because if it is for example as you said the quality of the food is not so good well that that's going to get observed right so anything that's not yeah no so exactly but so what, what whenever whenever it's going to get observed 
that's when you can, the way we model that, we model that as the usage cost is too high, you can't hide. If it's gonna be observed, then it's too high uh, of, 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 a, of a cost of hiding. And so then I won't invest. So if I think this cook stove may alter the taste of the food, then, the, then that's when we say, it's akin in our model saying the usage cost is too high. Um, and then you know, you won't try it out because it's, it's just like too, too, too risky. Got it. So you're saying as a special case, if I'm too worried about observability, I can just retreat to the part where you're not even trying it out. Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay. Okay. So anything that's like going to be observed easily in our model is, is the same as something that has a very high uh, hiding cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, you, I see more. Yeah, yeah. Before you go on, um, let's turn to Sue on for a second. Sue on. I was just thinking about the domains issue. I mean, there's so many domains that are gender biased, right? So whether women are allowed to go to the market and um, mm -hmm. that kind of issue. But you, you just, so you, you're just not ad addressing that. Sorry, I'm not, can, can, you, can you tell me more? I'm, I'm not uh, sure I, I, I know what you're referring to. Well, just whether you're addressing the issue that there are just gender norms associated with domains so that often women can't go to the market or don't have that. Yeah, so we're gonna look at the context where women do go to the market uh, and they are kind of responsible for, for a lot for, for the home production and the, a lot of the purchasing. So in a context where women don't manage money at all, uh, then this is not a relevant model. Yeah, this is relevant only in a context where where actually the husband wants to delegate to the wife uh, because he doesn't, you know, he can't deal with everything and she, she has a comparative advantage. He wants to delegate to the wife, but but only uh, in domains where she's an expert. Okay, uh, Morgan, you, you, you have your yeah, hand. Yeah, mine's kind of a clarifying question because I just want to make sure I understand the model well. Um, so. You, you kind of went quickly over the payoffs for the husband and wife, but I think they're the same. And if so, I was trying to understand or wrap my head around why the wife would want to hide her type. Why, if they have the same exact payoffs, can you explain that to me and maybe anybody else who's confused? No, so, so if, if, the, if the husband doesn't transfer to the, to the wife, then he's going to use that uh, amount omega for something else that has lower returns to the wife than the returns she gets from uh, getting the transfers, even if she, you know, if she, um, she only gets a, a return uh, of, of lambda, you know, eta R with it. With it. Um, I mean, it's, it's not quite that, but yeah. Um, so so the, 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 the idea that if the husband doesn't transfer to the wife, he doesn't use it for the same public goods that you know, she gets, that she uses it for. So she benefits less from that. Okay, so they do have different like ultimate payoff functions, basically. Yep. Okay, yep. cool. I wasn't getting that. Yep. I was getting confused. Yeah. Great, awesome. Okay, so then, uh, so what are the key, uh, you know, testable? Oh no, Jonathan, sorry, you wanted to say more. It's, Deborah just wanted to slip in. Oh, with sorry, that. I just had one more follow-up question, just to understand your model. Okay, yeah. so in the case where the usage cost is high, it seems to me that the only equilibrium has to involve initially excessive risk taking. Because if there are only two types, what what are you going to? Why just be safe? You might as well take the risk. No, but then you can only do it once. Okay, but at least you can do it once. I mean, well, but then, your but model, then, no, but then you model, have to compare. No, but then you have to compare. You know, if you do it once and you you are unlucky and it's a lemon, yes, uh, then you you've lost the flow. You know, forever you've lost the flow of transfers. Whereas if you if you play safe. Yes. You know, for as long as you can remain in the game, you get the, this flow of transfer. So you have to compare, you know, essentially the the the, the continuation value. And so, so I guess I mean I, I that's actually. But, I don't I, know but if you're like heading the, to you're heading towards the bad outcome in in that case for sure. But you're doing it yeah. slowly. That's the point, right? Yes. Just, yes exactly. Exactly. Okay. okay. Exactly. Um, okay, so the first a, a, a premise of our model is that the husband uh, is going to transfer um, based on his beliefs about the wife's expertise. Okay, uh, so we can just see whether that's the case. Okay, uh, we are going to want to test that in the data. And then we're going to have a prediction that um, the non expert wives invest no less than the expert wives when the price of hiding is, is low, so that they're pulling equilibrium in investing, but less uh, when the price of hiding is high. 
And then we have a, a second prediction, which is that non-expert wives conditional investing hide more than the expert wives, and the overuse of lemon and the sunk cost uh, fallacy. And then the third prediction is that when the cost of hiding is high, the gap in investing probabilities between experts and non-experts decreases as uncertainty about the quality of the risky good decreases. Okay, that, that's a corollary that, that derives from a corollary in a, in, in a paper. Oh, I completely forgot, guys. I was supposed to share the a link with the slides and the paper. Uh, well, we so did that. that. Oh, you did that already. Okay, you see my my classes are amazing. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, um, okay, so so that's the prediction number three. And um, so for the premise, we're going to test that in experiment one, which is a transfer experiment with husbands. Uh, predictions two, uh, one and two, we can uh, test with our signaling experiment with the wives. Um, and, and it's going to be, you know, th these wives and these husbands are going to be married to each other. Uh, and then prediction three, we're going to do this uh, uh, field experiment with married women at the market, uh, and we call it the investment experiment. Okay, so we have the transfer experiment, the signaling experiment, and an investment experiment. And then we have a prediction four, which says that the uh, behavior of the spouses uh, should stop responding to the wife's reputation once it has fallen below the cutoff reputation, above which discretionary transfers occur. And so we're going to be able to test that across all three experiments by comparing households where at baseline, the amount of transfer that we see is already you know, low, so it's only like for necessities, uh, versus high, where there's some transfer for like, discretionary spending, and we're gonna you know, test whether indeed we see all the mechanisms that we describe in the context of households where they still you know, again uh, being played, okay? So the, the separation has not you know, yet uh, happened, if you will. Uh, okay, so um, the experiments. Uh, the, so experiment one and two are you know, a lab in a field uh, with couples. So we are in uh, southern Malawi, Nile district, in 36 villages, we have uh, just over a thousand married couples. We did this just about two years ago um, when it was possible to, you know, to uh, walk around and go meet people and say, hey, what's up? So we went into compounds and said, hey, what's up? We would like to talk to both uh, the husband and the wife. Uh, if they were both there, it was great. We, you know, had one enumerator who went with a husband on one side of the compound and the uh, other enumerator went with a wife on the other side of the compound. And um, with the husband, we did a survey that embedded the transfer experiment, which is experiment one. And with the wife, we did a survey that embedded the signaling experiment, which is experiment two. Okay, so just a little bit about these households. You know, they've been married uh, for 10 years. They have a bunch of kids. Um, you know, they have some education, the husband has seven years, the wife has just um, not uh, six years, um, they're about 30, 35 years old. Husbands make about three times as much money as their wives. Uh, 30,000 uh, kwacha, uh, if I remember correctly, that's about, um, you know, 40, $45 um, over two months. And the wife, it's, it's about, uh, you know, it's, it's a third of that. Um, and there's some transfers. So on average, uh, husband's transfers, um, 8,000 kwachas to their wives, that's about like, uh, you know, 30% of their income, okay? Um, and, okay, so experiment one with a husband, what did we do? We had them play a dictator game uh, with multiplier, okay? So it means that we give them money and we say, you can choose how much of that money to actually transfer to your wife and whatever you give her, we actually are gonna uh, double, okay? So given that, they should, you know, want to give almost all of the money to the wife. Now, what we did is that we randomly assigned the husband to either of two versions of the, of the, of the, of the survey. Um, in the control version, they played you know, the dictator game uh, first, whereas in the science treatment, they played the dictator game right after a survey module that we called uh, the market expertise repetition module or MER. And in that module, we had them to recall instances when the wife both think that did not work. Okay, so this was, uh, the, uh, there were questions, do you think your spouse is ever tempted to buy things um, that uh, they see advertised at the pharmacy or supermarket? It seems like a new, more powerful, you know, mosquito repellent cream or a new gala that uses less charcoal, so that's a cook stove. Um, and, you know, so, and then can you provide an example of this scenario? Okay, and then has it ever happened that your spouse did in fact buy something that did not work as advertised? Uh, can you provide an example of this scenario? So these are the examples that we you know, got. Just, uh, you know, well, she bought a useless doll. She bought new plates when the goal was to buy a jar. Uh, she bought a pair of non durable shoes, bought clothes that were not budgeted for. 
you know, she bought a drug that was advertised as protecting from joint pain. She went, she bought curtain that were not in the budget. Okay, so these are the examples uh, of things that she bought that you know um, she was not kind of like she didn't go with intention to buy, but she ended up buying and being tempted to buy. And then you know examples of when she got kind of like ripped off. Um, we have like she bought a nice looking dish which broke down in just a month. She bought a drug that wasn't effective at all. She got carried away by what the vendor was telling her. She bought a pair of shoes that were not of the required foot size because the vendor told her it will fit. <laughs> That's my favorite. Uh, she bought second-hand bars painted to conceal the rust. Uh, she once bought cooking oil, which was mixed with water. Uh, and this one is funny as well. She was given short trousers by the vendor instead of a skirt. <laughs> okay, so this is like we made the husband think hard about the instances where you know the wife exhibited like gullibility um, and, and not not much savviness in the purchase decision. Okay, and so what do we do with um, what do we do with this? Uh, you know, we, we, we create an index for the wise market expertise reputation. So we have four questions like that. And then from that, we get uh, an MER uh, score. Uh, in the cross section, uh, we find that having a low uh, market expertise reputation is negatively correlated with how much transfers you get from uh, your, your, your husband. Um, now, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip that and go straight into the, the experimental results. Uh, which is that, you know, testing the prediction that when you make it very salient to the husband, uh, just before he has to make the transfer, that uh, the wife, you know, makes mistakes. Uh, do you see that the transfer uh, are, are lower? And that's exactly what we see in the experiment. We find that uh, uh, on average, uh, tr uh, husbands transfer 69% of the money to their wife. So that kind of nice in the dictator game with multiplier. But uh, if we made the low uh, market expertise reputation salient, uh, it goes down uh, by about 10 um, by, by 10 of a nine, okay, uh, which is equivalent to nine uh, percent, okay. Um, I mean nine nine percentage point, sorry. Uh, and um, okay, so that's that's the main that's a that's you know consistent with our premise that you know the repetition of the wealth is a matter for the transfers, okay. Uh, so now everybody's on board. It's kind of tricky when people are quiet. <laughs> so experiment two. Uh, do we see pooling when, uh, oh, Rohini has a question. Go, go for it. I was just curious. I mean, this seems like, you know, you prime and you see an effect. It would be nice to see that you don't see such an effect with another prime that is not market-based, but similarly, you know, makes uh, say something about, you know, say your wife is not very good at something which is not market related and show that you don't see this effect there. Because I'm just worried that your priming, in, it's, it's quite comparable to a common prime saying, you know, remember your, your partner is kind of semi-useless. So, um, and it's not necessarily got to do with this market feature. Yeah. Also, if you have to prime them, that means they are rather forgiving characters in real life, right? Well, I mean, the, the, remember here, the, the, because of the multiplier, even if they, even if they don't, don't, don't like the wife, you know, they, they, they would have an, I mean, the, the, the multiplier was, 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 was double or triple. So it's like, the, the, it, it's costly for them not to transfer. Okay, so that's, 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 that's why they may not um, react to that. But in the, in the, in the, in the, when we look at the cross section, uh, uh, this is, you know, if the wife has a, um, uh, um, an MER of, of, of three or four, you see the average amounts transferred are much higher than if it's an uh, MER of two or, 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 or one or zero, which is the omitted category, okay? Um, and so so in, in real life, when we look at the actual transfer that the report having made, it is correlated um, uh, quite a bit uh, inversely with, uh, with uh, you know, the, 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 the gullibility <laughs> of the wife or, or positively with her reputation. And we also have this variable, which is asking the husband, does she have access to cash? And we find that those who have a high uh, market expected reputation have. Um, now we don't, we, we could have the, the placebo. I think uh, Rowan, you're asking for a placebo uh, salience treatment where we make something else salient and see whether it mattered as well. Um, and then we, we did not, uh, uh, we did not do that. So uh, actually we do have, we do have, uh, we make her non-marketability salient. We vary the when or not we ask uh, her general ability. And we don't see similar effects with whether or not uh, there's no salient effect or interaction with the salient treatment with her general ability, her non-market related ability. So this general, 
ability, which is like their uh, like our, our school on math questions and stuff like that. But but did we did we we don't have a did we make that salience? Uh, yes, because the transfer the transfer experiment was either at the very beginning of the survey or at the very end of the yeah. survey. So, okay, so uh, so I guess yeah, so I guess that's that's one uh, one one nice placebo thing. Then I don't know if it satisfies you or any, but essentially, if we just made the the husband you know uh, tell us how well he thinks that the wife would do on uh, on Raven's mattresses. And he said she would do badly. It doesn't lead to the same. Uh -huh. No, I think that helps. That doesn't drive the results. Okay, thanks, Nina. Um, okay, so now uh, experiment two: uh, Do we see pooling when hiding is possible, but separating when hiding is too costly? So here we do the lab in a field with the wives, um, and uh, we start uh, by having them. Uh, I mean, at some point in the survey, do a quality quiz, which is six questions asking the wife to discern high versus low quality goods. Okay, so we brought like these goods. It was uh, you know the uh, pure granite versus diluted flour. She had to you know say which one was higher quality, um, you know uh, like a natural sponge versus a plastic sponge and stuff like that. Um, and uh, we we you know elicit the wife's beliefs about her score. So say how many, how how well do you think you did? So there were like six products, so she would get a score of zero to six. We ask her what she thinks her score is, and then uh, we inform the wife. Um, about a randomly drawn price of hiding mistakes just before we tell her that she can participate in, in a game uh, for money. So on top of the compensation she was getting for the survey, she can get extra compensation if she agrees to do this game, which is, you know, um, we first ask her, given the price of hiding, how many uh, errors do you want to correct? So, you know, how many, you can, you, you can use some of your uh, money, uh, compensation money and, and, and uh, participation fee to kind of like, buy you know cheat sheets and then uh, get the right answer and then you know do the quiz again and get a better score okay so we elicit from her how many uh, you know answers she wants to correct uh, and then we'll, we reveal the correct score to the husband so essentially we say we're going to tell your husband how well you've done but before we tell the husband you have a, you, you can you can fix your score okay and you can pay to improve your score okay so that's how we manage to like mimic this idea of paying a cost to hide okay um and you see for the signal to make a sense for the, uh, to the husband, we had the husband play the quiz himself. Okay, so he was, you know, with the other animator after, you know, having done this dictator stuff. Uh, then, you know, he also did the quiz as part of the survey. Okay, um, but he does not know that the wife um, uh, is playing the game um, at the time. Uh, and and if, she if she decides not to do that, not to send the signal to the husband, then he doesn't know that, she, you know, she could um, share the option to do it. And he doesn't know that she could correct her score in, in case he's uh, told uh, the score. So what we're going to observe is the wife's decision to participate. And so we're going to think of that as being akin to the decision to, to, to invest or not. And the willingness to uh, pay to correct, uh, uh, which is akin to hiding. Okay. And so what's going to be important is whether this varies with the wife's belief about her score. Okay. Because that's that's the belief about our score is what says what's the signal that she expects to be sent if there is no uh, she participates and she can't correct okay and then the price of hiding so if the price of hiding is high we anticipate that she's not going to be interested in participating as much as is the price of hiding is low okay and so how are we going to define the type we're going to have you know self-identified non-experts um, so the, the wives who say they they think their low their score is low uh, and those who think that their score is high okay. And the treatment arms we have, we you know, randomize the price, and then uh, and then uh, and then I'll show you in a, in a minute uh, something else. So this is what we, what we find. If you have a low perceived score, um, first you know you're kind of a corrector about that in a sense that indeed your initial score is significantly lower uh, than if you if you uh, don't have a low perceived score. Okay. Um, but uh, you know you you don't participate significantly less. Uh, unless you face a high price, okay? So if you face a high price and you have a low perceived score, that's when you, you participate uh, much less in the game, okay? And so you forego the compensation fee, okay? So you lose money by not participating, okay? Uh, if you have a low perceived score and so you, you participate as much, um, you er uh, end up uh, correcting a bunch of errors, okay? And paying a fee to correct your errors. 
And so ultimately your final score is actually not significantly different from uh, that of uh, the others, okay? So you, the signal that is being sent to the husband ultimately uh, is not significantly lower for, for this uh, non-experts because it's been able to hide, okay? So at the end, we find that, you know, there's the total foregone earnings is, 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 is higher if you have a low perceived score because you either had to pay to hide or or or, um, uh, or you uh, or you 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 decide to forego the participation fee. Okay, so now this is based on our low percy score. You say, well, this is not you know exogenous. Okay, this could be correlated with all sorts of stuff. Maybe those with a low percy score they also did not understand anything, and they are they are making mistakes because they just you know they are not uh, you know um, understanding the game. So what uh, we did is that we actually randomized the game version that they played. And this is quite the quiz that they had to do. We had a hard version and we had an easy version. Okay, so in the hard version, uh, we didn't give them hints, but in the easy version, we kind of like made it really easy for them. And so this, these hints were just kind of really telling her, you know, what to look for. And so the score, if you got the easy version, was you know more than one uh, point higher on average than if you had the, the hard version. So think of here, we are taking people and we are exogenously making them do badly. Okay, by giving them a hard quiz. Okay, and when we do that, we find that you know we have the uh, again that the hard version. Uh, if you face a high price, you are less likely to participate. Okay, um, and so you forego earnings from that. Uh, but if you choose to participate, then you uh, create quite a bit of errors, uh, and you pay quite a bit of a hiding fee uh, to in order to be able to to um, to, uh, to to correct the score. Okay. Um, and so that's kind of like the, and you know, here there's something a bit interesting, which is that if you get the hard version, but it's, it's cheap to, to hide, uh, you know, you don't participate less, maybe even like, you know, a little bit uh, more, though it's not significant, maybe because like, oh, that's my opportunity to shine, you know, in like this hard game, I actually did, did well because I can, I can, I can correct, okay? Um, so that's kind of like in line with our predictions that one, you know, you, you, the price is high, you, you are going to invest less. Uh, and in the price is low, you pull, so you don't participate less, but you're gonna hide, okay? Uh, so these are you know, in line with predictions one and two. Okay, so now uh, last uh, five minutes, you know, that is all matter outside of the lab. So we did this field experiment uh, a couple of months later with 675 uh, women uh, shopping at the market center. Uh, I mean, we, we wanted to do it with, 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 with uh, you know, married, uh, uh, women, so so we, um, you know, this was one of the first uh, question in the survey whether they were whether they were married, um, and we here we give them at the end of the survey the choice between a cash payout to thank them for participating in the survey uh, and a good, okay, uh, and so we have two goods, a, a children's book um, and our airtight crop storage bag, okay, and. Uh, the you know the, the goods are not familiar okay the children's book is like a board book like uh, images we actually couldn't find any locally in Malawi we had to like you know uh, bring them in our suitcases uh, you know the, the, for those of you who who like uh, Richard uh, scary you know so that's one of the uh, that's one of the the book the airport book um, uh, it was a huge uh, uh, people liked it quite a bit another you know an alphabet book. But these things are just not, you know, they are not available locally. They're like nice looking uh, board books. Uh, well, so the children's book is, 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 is uh, costly to use because when you buy a book, you know, the, the whole idea is to like read to your kids, like, you know, uh, every night. Um, uh, the airtight crop storage bag is much less costly to use because you just put your, your crop in there and then uh, it's supposed to, to prevent, um, you know, rotting and, then, um, and pests coming in there. Uh, but it's just like a one-time, you know, usage cost. Um, so we told people, these goods were not familiar, we told women why they were good ideas. We told them the science behind, you know, reading to your children uh, or pointing at pictures, your children and telling a story <clears throat> is good for their, you know, cognitive development. And this air type crop storage bag has been shown to indeed reduce, uh, you know, crop uh, damage. Um, and then we elicited their willingness to pay through a BDM mechanism for the new good. Uh, but she doesn't have to use her own money because she can just use the, the compensation money. Okay, so we can easily remains to pay without her having to disperse any of her own uh, money. And the, the treatment that we have is we put stickers on the goods. So we have the stickers uh, that say that uh, the, 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 that describe the proven returns, and we have a sticker that says uh, that uh, the item was donated by Stanford University. <laughs> um, 
And so the idea that with that is that we kind of like not we can remove the reputation concern because if the sticker says it was donated, then she, she has you know she can possibly uh, credibly say I didn't pay anything for it. You know, so this is this shouldn't matter for my no, it was just given to me. So yeah, maybe it's a lemma and I'm not using it, but I didn't pay for it. And the sticker uh, describing the problem return is going to just like uh, make it like the husband now. Um, uh, is going to be able to see that and be like, oh yeah, okay, so the the the, the this is a high productivity good, so there is no um, there is no risk. Um, and then the costs, as I mentioned, are different for these two products. And then we also make salient the relationship or not by either doing the BDM at the beginning of the survey uh, or at the end of the survey after we elicited um, you know information about the relationship with the house with the husband and asked about the transfers that she gets and decision making. Okay. Uh, so now the key thing, how do we you know, separate the two types of wives in this context where well, we could not administer the quality quiz at the market uh, because it was a bit, you know, we, were, we couldn't just go in there and start like looking like we are telling <laughs> women all the all, half of these products in this market are low quality. We would have been like kicked out by the vendors on the market. So we couldn't, and it was too time consuming in any case. So instead we use a proxy uh, that is easy to measure. <clears throat> And that we found was very highly correlated with a low perceived score in the quality quiz of experiment two, with that experiment two sample, uh, which is, uh, you know, the woman's uh, prior about her husband's beliefs about her mass score. Okay, so like second order beliefs about uh, mass score. Okay, so that's the non experts that they think that their husbands think that she's very bad in math, and then the experts just think that their husbands think that she's good in math. And uh, then what we be able to look at is uh, whether this non experts invest less. Uh, when there is no sticker, we find that she invests less. So this is the amount of money paid. So on average, they pay 350 quotas, uh, which is you know about half a, uh, half a dollar for the for the goods. Um, and uh, I mean this is like uh, you know normalized across the two goods. Um, so this actually monetary values don't make much sense here, but the relative values make sense. So the non-expert uh, is willing to pay 90 uh, less on average, and that's significant. But when we add the sticker, then these interaction terms are positive and go the other way. So when you put a sticker now, you don't see a separation between the non-expert and the expert. If you sum this coefficient and this coefficient, or this coefficient and this coefficient, if both of the stickers actually uh, end up having the exact same effect, that they remove, um, you know, the 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 the, the, the they now make the expert non-expert willing um, to invest as much as the expert. And Deborah, before I take your question, let me just finish because I'm almost there. Uh, we find that the uh, usage cost, uh, you know, it, it, for the children's book where there's a higher usage cost, this is where we see the stronger relationship. So that's where the, the um, you know, lower uh, willingness to, to, to pay is stronger. Um, and now we pull all the stickers uh, together as for uh, simplicity. And then, so that's where the, you know, you still see in both cases, you see the same pattern, right? It's negative if you're an expert and then the interaction term is positive and brings the sum to zero, but here it's kind of like weaker. And here is like much stronger when the usage cost is high. This is by salience. The effects again in both cases we see the same, you know, pattern minus here and compensated by this. But the the magnitudes are again stronger when you made the relationship with the spouse salience. And uh, and I guess yeah, maybe I should take your question here, uh, Deborah. Or should I just uh, take a minute to to conclude? Because I think uh, I'm out of time. Pascaline, why don't you go ahead and and conclude okay. quickly okay. and then okay. we'll move forward. So, um, so the last thing is that, you know, in all three experiments, this is experiment one, experiment two, experiment three, we find that the, the key, uh, you know, kind of the, key, the, the key test of our prediction holds when uh, we, uh, much more when we focus on households where there is still high transfers from the husband to the wife compared to households where it's low transfers, which is like the wife has already been, you know, uh, uh, there's already uh, been a separation in the sense that she, she, she's been revealed to be uh, 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 at least non-expert in at least sufficiently many domains that overall she gets, you know, fewer, uh, fewer transfers. And so this is the idea that this, you know, salience effect, if you have low reputation, only matters if the husband is still making transfers to you. And the fact that if you get a high price in the hard version, uh, you are going to be uh, much, uh, uh, you're going to forego much more uh, income in order to hide sending a signal. Uh, and the sticker effects um, compensating for your low, low, low investment with a sticker is there as well. Okay, so this is uh, very consistent across the three. So 
I guess I'm I'm out of time. I don't know if anybody in the chat has brought up the concern that maybe you know the the, the our mechanism, which is I don't want to lose the transfers. Is that really the story, or is that I don't want to be beaten up? So we don't think that this story of the fear of domestic abuse is is a driver. Uh, but obviously that's an important thing to to, to think about. And so I'm going to just stop here because I'm out of time. Um, thank you so much. And I'm gonna, hopefully there is a minute or two for. Uh, for questions, I guess. Oh no, I should, should say one thing. Why does this matter? Besides the fact that it's been so much fun to work with Nina and Roberta on this, and also I should say Nina is going to be on the job market in a few years, so be on the lookout because she's absolutely awesome. Uh, you know, besides all the fun we've had together, uh, we think it matters. <laughs> Why does it matter? Uh, because it, it could really be a driver of underinvestments and uh, uh, you know low low willingness to experiment. And in fact, a lot of the NGOs and governments out there that tend to put the onus on women and say, hey, we should reach out to the women. Women should experiment. They, we, we should go to them and say, do you want to buy this school school? Do you want to buy this bed net? Do you want to buy this new thing? Maybe it's putting too much of the onus on them and putting too much pressure. And there's no reason why they should make these decisions if it matters for you know uh, their, their repetition within the household. So um, I'm going to stop here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pascaline. I can assure you, Pascaline, that Roberta and Nina have been very, very busy in the chat. There have been a lot of questions, um, and I think mostly they've been answered. So I want to thank you, Pascaline and Roberta and Nina. Um, and I want to turn things to Robin Burgess for a, a final word. And then if people want to stay on um, with questions after that, I, I assume that Pascaline and Nina and Roberta will stay a few minutes, um, but Robin, do you want to? Um, yeah, what I wanted to do word. is basically say that the next Brad MBR conference will be on the 22nd of October. So put that in your diary. Hopefully, some part of that will be in person. Who knows? And also, obviously, to thank Rajiv Siwan Orandrilla, Rahimi Debraj, Martin, and Maria for organizing a brilliant conference. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and this concludes the final session of the Bread Conference. Thank you to everybody. And, um, and Nina, Pascaline, and Roberta, thank you. And if there are extra questions, um, I think you'll stay around for a few minutes. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much. Hey, Pascaline, can I ask you my question? Yeah. Oh, great. Actually, your paper, I realized that it was presented in the Thread Conference as well, right? Yes, that's right. I think this is a unique paper. <laughs> okay. It was presented in both. Uh, oh. <laughs> so my question, my question is very simple. It's that your, um, your theory, the way you're starting, suggests that husbands and wives should both be administered these damn experiments and they should react very differently, right? I mean, if one is in the habit of building a reputation and the other yeah. doesn't give a damn, right? Then it should, yeah. it should come yeah, yeah, of course, so, yeah, of course. I mean, we would actually, we, 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 we wanted to do that, uh, try to do it both and be symmetric, but unfortunately the, you know, <laughs> this entire thing, when we brought an NSF proposal to get funding, we, we got very nasty uh, reaction. So I, you know, essentially used whatever uh, funding I had at some point to pay for it. Uh, yeah. It was kind of like a, a shoestring. Yeah. So we don't, we don't, oh. we don't, it's too small for, for the husband. So we, we didn't manage to get the, the same sample. Yeah. Oh. yeah. It seems almost but, like an acid test for this one, at least for this particular channel. Right? Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the thing is that it could be that there are many, I mean, it could be that the husbands don't want to lose face for some other reasons. Like it could be that I don't, right. you know, I, I, it's kind of like uh, there's some, I don't want to look like a loser or anything like of that. Course, so then of be... course. So if you got the same results, things would still be up in the air. Now, if you just always got different results, you could then trace that to the asymmetry at the home, perhaps, right? Or no, no, I, I don't no, know. I mean, no. Okay. If, if DRI has some money they want to give us to try that, uh, please, uh, we'll take it. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, guys. That was so much fun, all of it. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks Thank you, everybody. Right. And is there a way to save the chat? Like, um, since it was recorded? Yes, yes, it will be sent to you. You can keep, yeah, the chat, um, yes. Um, Aditi or somebody's going to be in touch and we'll just send you the entire chat. Yep. It will be oh, all fantastic. the private messaging will be removed and the rest will be sent. <laughs> okay, hopefully there wasn't, we're, we're into any side conversation. No, no. Um, did anybody else have a question? I, have a question? I mean, I, did, uh, I, I guess I had a quick question, or maybe it's too long a question, but I was wondering, I feel like 
you know, you said you, you put this initial study together on shoestring budget. Like I figure if you're going to go apply for a grant, you'd want to kind of have an intervention in mind. What would be, what would be like the intervention you think would help with the thing that you're documenting? What would be like your. No, I mean, really this was, we just, we, 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 we just wrote up the theory and then we just wanted to test it. Right. So never. I mean, this is, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's not for. I mean, it's really, the, the point is really asking the question of like, when does it make sense to kind of like expect the wives to be the ones making all of these decisions when it comes mm -hmm. to, you know, in, investing and stuff. Uh, and, you know, I think a, a lot of the uh, marketing, social marketing also is, is geared towards uh, women. And that's maybe, you know, the, mm -hmm. you know this, there's this view, which is, oh, they are the ones who care more about the kids and all of that, but we are just highlighting the fact that, uh, you know, in some cases, they may actually not want to be responsible for the decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's really the... Uh, but, on, but on the other end, we could see experiment three as kind of like a mini policy intervention experiment, right? Because we're, we're checking... Speakers. If it, yeah, exactly. If women can credibly convey to their husbands like the quality of the good, does that increase the investments in like uh, in new technologies? And in experiment three, we do we see that is the case. So it's, yeah. that's like a mini policy yeah. experiment by itself. And yeah, it's interesting to think about because if that technology hits the market, then you would kind of destroy the pooling equilibrium, and that would have different welfare implications for low and high type women, right? What, what do you mean if this technology hit the market would be so like if you if you are suddenly able to invent some kind of like credible signaling technology where like women could credibly signal to their husbands their type what mm -hmm. what would happen then is the the low type women couldn't hide anymore the way that they're able to so i don't oh, know yeah but we don't that so that's not what we're saying you should do um the, 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 what the stickers do is that they they help um you know, make the, the they remove kind of like the risk that the wife is taking. It's like yeah. the way for her to say, look, this is you know, the the mm -hmm. I, I didn't you know I didn't have to use my judgment. Um, you know, there's just like science behind this. You know, um, so this maybe this paper says you want science to be at the forefront. <laughs> yeah, yeah than, I get it. It's like you remove yeah. the uncertainty behind yeah. the goods that they're purchasing, so you kind of render the expertise less relevant. Yeah. Actually, so you you pull yeah. you pull their types basically. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Yeah, which is another argument for maybe why this is more of an issue in a developing country context where goods are less certified or less mm -hmm. regulated in some way. Yeah, and you have all sorts of like counterfeits and all sorts of like fakes and stuff. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. It was an interesting project. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I just had a super quick question, which was, um, I think it popped up in the chat, but, but you know, there was so much going on. It's about the earnings gap. And, and you know, on average, it's it's a third. And, and so that's quite high. But but it's surely you have some variation within sample. And my, mm -hmm. my sense is that all this theory really depends on, on, on the wife, depending on the money, right? So, so wouldn't you like be able to dis, disentangle a little or, or just do some heterogeneity along that? Well, I mean, I think even, I mean, we, we, we can probably, we can look at that. I don't think we've done that, but even if, you know, even if I make a bunch of money, I still am better off if I get uh, more for my husband <laughs> because I can invest it in the public good and, and he would not. So obviously then it's an curvature. And so maybe um, I don't care as much, but I still am still better off if the husband puts the Omega into the public good through me rather than he spending it on, 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 on whatever. Yeah, so I think the patients hold even if if the wife uh, actually makes makes money. It doesn't if she's not married. I mean, <laughs> I mean she's not. You know, if she, she doesn't receive transfers um, from somebody. I mean, the the relevant heterogeneity margin is kind of the financial dependence that we're looking at uh, by by the heterogeneity of the transfer size, right? As opposed to the income margin. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 that's just whether or not I've, you know, we use a, pro you're still getting transfers um, of, um, yeah. you know, meaningful size as a proxy for not having yet gotten, uh, uh, you know, my type being revealed in too many domains, if I'm an expert in some domains. Okay, this was great. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, Thank you. I, Thank I, you I really appreciate the opportunity and I look forward to reading the chat. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody.